Welcome to episode 246 of the Necronama.com. You know what's really scary? Book bans. Long a tool of authoritarians, book bans are a direct threat to our freedom to read. That's why Library Foundation SD, Brooklyn Public Library, and other partners across the country have launched Books Unbanned to fight this evil. This campaign makes frequently banned or challenged books available through a digital catalog to young people across the U.S., including states with increasing book bans. Like your local library, it's completely free to sign up. Want to learn more, including how you can help increase access to the books we love? Visit LibraryFoundationSD.org. Fright Rags has been bringing you the best in horror, apparel, and accessories since 2003, offering a wide range of products for your favorite creature features, slasher flicks, and cult classics. Officially licensed collections include titles like John Carpenter's The Thing, The Evil Dead, Creep Show, Jaws, the Halloween franchise, and so many more. Head on over to fright-rags.com. Make sure to sign up for their SMS and email newsletter to never miss a drop. Listeners get 10% off when they use the code NECRO10, all caps, at checkout. I am James Sabata, horror author, screenwriter, co-host of the podcast you're listening to right now. And I'm not talking again the rest of this episode because Don has sworn he will kill me if I do. <laughs> and I'm Don Guillory, author, educator, co-host of the podcast that you are listening to as well. And uh, I just got to say this because I'm going to say it probably a few times during this episode. Uh, fuck the Daughters of the Confederacy uh, and fuck everything that they did to screw up the American educational system with regard to especially history. Uh, so fuck the Daughters of Confederacy. Fuck them, fuck them, fuck them. They're horrible people, and they're one of the reasons why all these stupid statues are everywhere. Absolutely. All right. Joining us today, Dewan L. Hearn. The moon has returned to us. Welcome back. Hello. Man. How's it going, Welcome, guys? welcome. So uh, you want to... It's a pleasure and honor. Absolutely. And we love having you. You've had some great episodes already. We'll we'll probably talk about that and send people back to check them out. I might even use one as my double feature. We'll see. But uh, you want to tell our listeners a bit about yourself, man? Uh, you know, it's funny. Like, I was talking to somebody about this uh, a little while ago, and I've done so much in just the last year. Like, I'm actually right. done shit. Um, like, from June last year, I have written a screenplay, got an award for it, had it produced, released a book. I'm now the host of two podcasts, Socko and the Moon and the Moon Equals Wrestling Podcast. And all of that just happened like within like the last year. Yeah. I remember you winning an award, me chanting, you deserve it, and you telling me that you don't. And I don't know if you remember this, but at one of the room parties, I told you if you really feel you didn't deserve it to work your ass off until you feel you did. And I hope that this year, if you win another, that you will react in a more self-positive way because we believe in you and I'm excited to see everything you've done. And if you don't believe in you, I will accept the award on your behalf so then you can get <laughs> congratulated for it. <laughs> <laughs> you know what's funny? I since since that happened last year, because I found out about it after the fact, and no one told me who it was that said it. No one told me. I couldn't remember who it was. Like I, I you know, if we had run into each other again, I would have been pointing out, pointing out. But I, I don't remember her name. I, I didn't see her again. After. For any listeners who were not at the room party, this nice older white lady. Came up to Don and congratulated him for winning Dewan's award earlier in the night because you know everybody looks the same, right? So we all look alike. Yeah, I mean, yeah. We're, 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 I mean, we're like light skinned black guys who don't have a whole lot of hair. That's that's really kind of about the, that's <laughs> that's really it, though. <laughs> I just I just remember myself and Scott Bradley sitting there just like, oh, fuck, is this really happening in front of us? And uh, yeah, good times. 
So I'm, Man, I'm at, I almost wrote a book about it. <laughs> I'm doing I'm doing Saco in the Moon. We're interviewing Steven Zimmer for his uh, book tour recently. And we were doing a bonus episode for our Patreon. And and my co-host Saco was like, Oh yeah, by the way, I did that. <laughs> Apparently at some point Sako did it. And for like the last year, no one told me like she didn't say a word to me about it. She's like, yeah, that was me. It was not Sako. <laughs> it wasn't her. <laughs> Sako says she did it. Like, that was her words. Oh, it wasn't, it wasn't her. her. <laughs> I mean, she might have done it too, but it wasn't her. <laughs> okay, well, she may have done it also, but that makes it worse, kind of. <laughs> if it happened more than once. I, I have a very important question. What is Sako and the Moon? Sako and the Moon is a podcast. Um, she's an independent uh, horror author. I'm an independent horror author, and we just kind of go over craft and discuss writing, you know, writing horror and doing things like publishing a book, really doing short films and doing things like that as an independent without the big machine behind you. We talk about the Omni hat, which is our, our metaphor for how the independent has to do everything for themselves. Mm-hmm. And uh, we just kind of go over all that today we did an episode discussing fear what what creates fear how do you incorporate fear accurately into your works and things like that beautiful and what's your other podcast that is the moon eagles wrestling podcast because surprise surprise i have a wrestling podcast <laughs> <laughs> if anyone heard the uh what was it the menu that we did mm-hmm. but it turned into basically a two-hour promo for my t-shirt that says everything <laughs> Comes back to wrestling. <laughs> Thanks for that, guys. We do <laughs> it. Ironically, we, ironically, I'm wearing today. Um, but it's a it's basically it's just me talking about wrestling and all the things I love about wrestling, the elements of wrestling, the how they correlate to this, that, and the third. Just I don't want to do the this happened on Monday Night Raw and this is what happened on Dynamite. No, there's enough podcasts for that. This is more so. Um, there's too many championship titles in professional wrestling. This is this is my reasons why. Uh, my thoughts on intergender wrestling. I did an interview with John Cosper, who is a, a biographer for professional wrestlers. Um, that was a really, really good episode. So if you get a chance to find my YouTube and check out that interview. It's pretty dope. And then let's say somebody wasn't a writer and they weren't into wrestling, but they still wanted to support you. And they really, really hated Logan Paul. Would you say you have any merchandise for that? You know, as specific as that request was, <laughs> conveniently, I do. Available at dewanelhern.com slash shop. There Fantastic. just so happens to be a hashtag FLP t-shirt that may or may not mean fuck Logan Paul. <laughs> I just live to hear you say those three words. Uh, I know. All Anyone right. Else enjoys hearing me say that they can buy that T-shirt. That's right. <laughs> so uh, let, let's bring it to the movie. Um, so I, when when we decided we were going to end this podcast, there was I don't know, Don. What would you say? Seven hundred and fifty movies that we wanted to cover still, with like eight weeks left to go. Uh, and, uh, probably about eight hundred twelve. <laughs> So I, I went to Don and I was like, specifically, what are like a couple movies you really, really want to cover? And and I had a couple as well. Um, Shawshank was one of mine. We recently did that episode. And the final episode of the show, which will be Silence of the Lambs, was also mine. And, and Django kept coming up. And I was like, man, I, I think that if, if any movie is horror, history, social commentary... And then, and then there's like this weird vibe of like, like, oh, we all have to hate Tarantino because he's still like fucked this up or whatever going on in like the online communities. And I was like, this movie is made for our fucking show, man. And, uh, and so <clears throat> you have a very interesting backstory with owning this movie, Dwan. <laughs> and uh, would, you, would oh, you care to oh. share? It? No, it, it, don't, don't get too excited. Um, I have this thing about owning movies. And if I find a movie interesting, I'll find it at the store. If it's at a great price, I'll buy it. 
and mm-hmm. then it goes into my collection and it sits there. I bought this movie years ago. Never watched it. I had it out specifically to watch. Never watched it. I watched it for the first time like three weeks ago. <laughs> and Get how many the times fuck out of here. That you've seen it since then. Three times. I saw it twice this week. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I had I had a process because I hadn't seen it because I hadn't seen it I was like I'm gonna watch it once watch it all the way through get my natural emotion and you know opinion of it watch it a second time because all horror movies should be watched twice at least um, and this gives me a chance to know what's gonna happen but see what I may have missed and then as a callback to when I did high tension I have notes <laughs> that's right. Okay. And I came to you because I remembered you saying at some point you loved Tarantino. I know Don's going to enter 500 jokes here about you went to a black guy. And that's fine. Yeah, I get it. Was it, James? But, I was uh, not. <laughs> just, just three three jokes, not 500. But uh, no, legitimately, I was like, man, I swear Don told me he loves Tarantino. So I came to you about this movie. And you were like, yeah, I'll do it. And so I had no idea. And I thought it was so funny when I found out that you hadn't seen it. So I was yeah. like, "Oh, <laughs> yeah." You know, it, it's I've been I've been I've been meaning to watch it. I've heard a lot about it, and I it, I do like Tarantino. It's amazing how many Tarantino movies I have not watched, um, but the ones I have watched, you know, I, I enjoy because as a filmmaker, I look at movies differently now. As a screenwriter, I, write, I look at movies differently now. So. Object my objective opinion, my personal opinion, they're all you know, not necessarily the same. So, you know, we'll get into all that as we get more and more into the movie. Absolutely. Uh, I saw this when it came out, and then I saw it again to do this. And uh, and I liked it a lot the first time. This time I was absolutely blown away. Don, what about you? Had you seen this before? Oh, all right. <laughs> was that I, believable? I can try again. I, I've lost track of how many times I've seen this movie. I probably watch it about four or five times a year, at least. Um, And it's one of those things where the movie itself, I can watch it at any point that it's on, and I'm fully, like, involved in the movie. Um, I saw this movie Christmas Day, December 25th, 2012. Went on my first date as a newly separated man from my marriage. Oh, good God. <laughs> I was here. Here's the story. Here's how it goes. Like, I'd already filed the paperwork, and then I was like, I was like, I'm not doing anything wrong. I have, I'm like, I'm telling people, like, no, I don't want to go out because I'm, I'm, it's too early, it's this, whatever, right? So people are already trying to fix me up. Claudia happened to have contacted me during this period of when I, you know, I'd filed and everything like that. So I was like, you know what? Fuck it. People are going to make up shit if they want to make up shit. They're going to make claims about whatever was going on. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to see if she's if she's free. So texted or called or whatever. I'm like, hey, I don't want to go visit my family for for uh, for Christmas. I really don't care. Uh, and I just I'm just getting divorced now. And I'm not looking for like a day. I just want to hang out with somebody. So we ended up going to the, you know, going to Disney World, I'm sorry, Disneyland, because it was like, no, fuck it, like, I'll pay, don't worry about anything, we'll just hang out, whatever, there's nothing else is involved, as far as, like, there are no strings attached with it, but if something happens, something happens, and of course, here we are, 12 years later, we're married with a child, but went to go see it, and honestly, I did not like the movie the first time I watched it, I was like, it's okay, it's, you know, it's, there's some Tarantino-ness to it, but it's not Inglorious Bastards because that was the previous movie. I'm like, I loved Inglorious Bastards. It definitely ain't Pulp Fiction. It ain't Jackie Brown. But then I, while I was watching it, I fell asleep at one point and I was getting pissed off because I was thinking like, where the fuck is Samuel Jackson? Where is Samuel L. Jackson in this movie? <laughs> I wake up and it's the part where I just see his face. I'm like, oh, fuck. We're gonna, I'm going to watch this movie. I love the part with Samuel J- and so like for Claudia and I, when we're talking about the movie afterwards, we were talking more about his presence on screen 
because so much hadn't really been analyzed about the movie, discussed about the movie, you know, from a historical perspective, from a sociological perspective. The real issue was, oh, my God, Tarantino did a movie about slavery and had the N word in it. And I remember reading and then seeing the post and, and the articles about him like, what the fuck do you want someone to say in the 1850s in Mississippi, Tennessee and Texas? Right. It was very commonplace. I can show you the historical documents where that was. That's how people were being described, whether you're free or enslaved. Um, but when I saw the movie, I was like, this this was really good. It was a it, it, thing is, it wasn't a movie about slavery. It was a Western. It was a Western splatter punk horror because there are these great moment, moments where it's like, oh, my God, like this is just so over the top. This is so ridiculous as far as what's taking place. But it was it was almost like it was Tarantino's cathartic response of like, I just read a shitload about slavery. I saw how bad it was. So I'm going to I'm going to just kill a bunch of white people in this movie, you know, just to, to point out that slavery is bad. But I'm going to make a slave the hero because so much of American history, when it's being taught, never talks about slave uprising, doesn't talk about slave revolts, doesn't talk about, you know, John Brown doesn't talk about the way in which there were people who were actively fighting against the system. Uh, but also fighting to preserve their own lives and those those lives that their people that close to them, as opposed to, I'm just gonna kill whatever to gain my freedom. You see how it's 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 larger than that, and that it's it because of the way that the system of U.S. chattel slavery was set up, you are never removed from the system because if you're free, there's still that survivor's guilt of you're free, but a family member of yours is still enslaved or risking your, your life to try and save that person or trying to buy that person or doing any number of things to ensure that you're not the only one who's free. That's a long answer to tell you that I love this movie now. <laughs> and, I, and, I, and I use it as part of my, my uh, history courses to talk about how this movie is a shitload more accurate, historically accurate and time period accurate than that piece of shit gone with the wind. If you love Gone with the Wind, I, I seriously question your life choices. And I mean, love love Gone with the Wind as far as like, oh my God, this reminds me, this is what my grandmother used to say, my great-grandmother used to say about this. It's my South. heritage. It's so beautiful. Oh my God, let's go get married at one of those places. They're so wonderful. If you get married at a plantation, uh, a plantation home, you are like just as bad as people who take selfies at Auschwitz and smile. Like, or, you know, you happen to own Twitter and to, to, you know, push off any rumors that you might be a Nazi, you go to, you know, Auschwitz with Ben Shapiro. And oh, God. Uh, that was such a dry <laughs> joke. So. I know. Well, so is he. The dry, dry humor. So is his wife. So, <laughs> no, no, no. Around him, she is. <laughs> we don't. <laughs> Last guy, she's never met me. So, I'm sure there's. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I, I have heard that the moon influences tides. I do. It's the motion of the ocean. I am the motion of the ocean. Well, there as we a are. doctor, I can <laughs> confirm that. It's a deep joke. Anyway, uh, <laughs> now that we've totally fallen off track, uh, right. uh, Don, I, I have a legit question before we go much further. I just want to get your viewpoint on this as a historian mm -hmm. and a writer. There's this lovely term that gets thrown around, revisionist history. Oh, God damn it. And I was wondering if uh, I could do it, but it would take me like 30 minutes to try to piece all my words together. And I don't know that I would do it justice. Do you have a view on what constitutes revisionist history in this manner and revisionist history in like, I don't know, Antifa caused January 6th? You know, like just an example. <laughs> Just, but like, uh, you know, just blatantly lying about history versus revisionist history like this. Oh, my goodness. Let me tell you something. There's this horrible person <laughs> uh, named, by the name of Dunning who came up with this thing called the Lost Cause Narrative. The Lost Cause Narrative, for those of you who don't know, is this idea in the South, or excuse me, an idea that the South, the Confederacy, um, everyone going into it knew what they were going to fight for. They were fighting for honor. They were fighting for a just cause. They knew they were going to lose, but they were doing it because they felt that they were right in doing it. 
And in, because they felt right in doing it, because they felt they were doing God's will and all this other bullshit, they should be absolved from any accountability. Um, that's a shortened version of it. The longest version is, um, I don't want to feel as though my grandpappy was you know, a slaveholder and wanted to defend the institution of slavery. So I'm going to come up with a bullshit excuse about, um, you know, he was doing this because it was the, standing up against the government. They knew they were going to lose, but they still fought. Um, so anyway, revisionist history for entertainment purposes is great, especially when you're advertising. It's this is for entertainment. This is not for educational purposes. This is not to serve as a historical artifact. Whereas you have individuals like those who go from the from the Dunning School, what's known as the Dunning School, the Lost Cause Mythology School, that believe that the mythology of this event, the cause of, of the Civil War, cause you know. Um, the, the Americans' participation in chattel slavery, they honestly believe in looking at the documents that you should look at them a different way and not actually judge them for what they are. You should judge them as, well, if slavery wasn't as bad as people make it sound. Or slaves were happy to have, you know, roofs over their head or whatever. Or uh, these black people were saved from a life of sin because they came to know Jesus Christ. Or if you happen to be the governor of Florida, you say that slavery taught people skills. So it's a way of taking whatever was negative about the situation and then trying to change it to where it's whoever the actors who committed the atrocities, they're not bad people because something good came up as a result. So, yes, we beat, raped, did all these bad things to these to these black people. But we gave them Christianity or yeah, they, that, that's you know, they were such a fucking on point. Like that should be on a goddamn shirt right there. Uh, I'm sorry. sure somebody has it. I'll go to another gun show and I guarantee you it'll probably be there. They did the same thing with, with medical history and all the experimentation yes. that was done on black women. Uh, now the science and what they've eventually learned for from it, Sure, that helps people today, but that doesn't negate how horrific uh, the experiments that they 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 did on on black people for the, the sake of medical science, the excuse of medical science, and it's more so the excuse of medical science. Like, but we have to learn, we have to advance medicine, so we torture these people. And yeah, so fuck J. Marion Sims, by the way. Right. <laughs> and you know, so, but you know, it wasn't just in the case of slavery, like you know. But it, this this happens. This happened a lot. Mm -hmm. Surprise, surprise. And, and I, I, you know, just like you said, like if it's for education, it needs to be as accurate as humanly possible. Get your documentation out. Do your research. Yep. If it's for entertainment, man, eh, <laughs> be close. Don't. There, there is one thing I, I'll mention because it's important, and it's the conversation I have off and on. It's like. When you look at something like Django Unchained, you run the risk of either being really, really brutal and kind of turning people off because of how visceral, I guess the best word I have to describe like anything that depicts slavery, how visceral mm -hmm. things are, or you have the risk of sugarcoating it, which as Mitch yes. Hedberg would describe is add sugar to. And you... You risk of softening it and then giving the impression, well, you saw that movie that that didn't depict it so bad, you know, and you know they're all in three piece suits. Like that's not how that shit was. And right. so it's important that if even if you're going to do it for entertainment, there has to be a level of authenticity. You mentioned earlier the use of the N word. Personally, not my word. I don't like to use it. It's mm -hmm. not something that's for me. My black card says I can. I choose not to. Mm -hmm. And it's used a lot in this yeah. movie. But like you said, that's also how they talked in that time period, two years before the Civil War. You kind well, of even Mark, well, even Mark Twain, he included the word in, in his books, especially uh, Tom Sawyer and Huck Finn. And I can't remember which one had the N-word more and not including, you know, Jim's name. But that that was like a point of contention for the longest because I remember when I was in college in the '90s, there was discussions of push pulling, you know, uh, Tom's sorry, Tom Sawyer, um, Mark Twain's 
uh, books from schools because I'm like, well, it says the N word a lot. And I was taking a couple of English courses at the time. I was still trying to learn something about something. And I remember my, my professor, Dr. Larry Burton, he had pointed out, you know, articles and research on this. And, and I can't even remember if he said the word when we were when we were in the class. Now, some of my other professors had no problem saying it, by the way, which was uh, interesting. Um, <laughs> shout out to Georgia Southern in the 90s. Um, <laughs> he, you know, he's pulling up articles and talking about in, and even showing writings from Mark Twain explaining, like, I did this because I didn't want you motherfuckers to run from it. Don't don't come up here and act as though people were are not saying this, you know, in public, not behind closed doors. They're saying this in public. So I want you as a white reader to look at this and see how fucking horrible it is. Mm -hmm. And and I'm going to shock you with the use of this word. I'm paraphrasing all this. I'm going to shock you with the use of this word, but I'm not going to take the word out. So if somebody has to live with the indignity of being called that, you can deal with the discomfort of having to read it right either to yourself or aloud. And that kind of goes back to what James was talking about when it comes to the idea of revisionist history. You know, we we look back on older stories, older pieces of of art, film, books, whatever, and, and so many people want to try to like clean it up and screw like, well, we don't talk like that anymore. Good. But exactly. we did the talk point. like that when, we did talk like that when this book was written. We did talk like that when this movie was made. Mm -hmm. And as a creative, I'd be damned if in 30 years people want to start cleaning up my my work. No, you leave my work exactly the way it is. It's that way for a reason. It's a reflection of the times. Just like Gone in the Wind's reflection of the time. Like Roots was a reflection of the time. Django is a reflection of that time, not so much when it was made, but from the time it depicts. Mm -hmm. And right. it needs it needs to be a certain way. And I think Tarantino did right by that. A little well, excessive yeah. almost, but yeah. I mean he was he was skating the line there. He was skating the line. Well, I think with, with Leonardo DiCaprio, because I will I will never forget to include this story, but I can't remember what scene they were shooting, but Leo, Leonardo DiCaprio was go, having an issue and he brought it up to Samuel Jackson. He's like, I don't like saying this word. Like, I'm having a lot of trouble getting it out. Now, when you're watching the film, it looks fucking natural. Like, that's yeah. how good he is. But he was telling people, like, I think even Kerry Washington, like, I don't, I don't like doing this. Like, I don't want to say this word. And, and Samuel Jackson's response was, motherfucker, it's Tuesday. You think I've never heard that word before? Say the fucking word. <laughs> and and apparently that was enough for, for Samuel Jackson to be like, look, like, don't fuck, like, don't feel as though you can't do this because you got to understand there are people who are being called this now. Like, you're not yeah. that person. You're representing those fucking horrible people that are out there that think that behaving like that is OK. I mean, even up to I just I just watched an interview of, of, of um, oh my, Reggie Jackson. And oh, yeah. it was talking about um, his time in, in Birmingham. Like he said that uh, Bear Bryant had come to see him and he said, quote unquote, now I'm going to not include the entire thing. He says, we need a good end boy like you because you're a hard worker and you're smart and you're going to help change things. This is, you know, the, the late 60s, early 70s. He's telling this to Reggie Jackson. Now, Reggie Jackson at this time was not Mr. October, but he's still a human being who doesn't need to be called that. <laughs> right. And people, and people forget that, like, you know, we had the whole, you know, shut up and play ball kind of thing when it comes to mm -hmm. athletes wanting to take a stand on social issues. And everyone forgets about, I, I want to say it was either LeBron James. I'm convinced it was LeBron James, but it could have been Dwayne Wade. Could possibly have been both. Um, had the N word spray painted on their driveway. You know, I forget when this was. It was some years ago, but might have been LeBron. I think it was LeBron. And I feel like it was, was that, that there was that incident in Phoenix where some, and I'm going to say this because it's 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 relevant. Some white fans spray painted go cards on. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, no, they didn't spray spray. They they put diesel. They wrote it out in diesel and then let 
uh, uh, and then tried to light the concoction on, on, on fire, right? So it was like mm. a gasoline and something mixture. Um, right. On Donovan McNabb's lawn, and then when the police they were like, oh, you know, it was just a prank, and they're like, you one, you did this to, one, a wealthy guy. He said, but then two, you did this to a black guy. There's a long history of people burning people's, you know, property, black people's property. Like, that doesn't look good, buddy. So you probably need to... <laughs> You need to learn a little something out there about what you shouldn't be doing to people, uh, regardless of race, but then also understand the extra weight of doing stuff like that. And, right. it's, not, and it's, it's not just a joke. It's not just a prank. Yeah, I'm a very good prank stuff. anyway. Like, like, oh, I'm going to burn part of your shit. Like, that's not a good prank. <laughs> like, yeah, that's just vandalism uh, with, a, with a sprinkling of hate crime. But no, yeah. the point is, like, you have these these people who think like, oh, well, they're just celebrities. They're just they're basketball players. They don't need to have an opinion. They don't need to speak up. No, because it still happens to them. Mm-hmm. It doesn't matter if you got ten dollars in your in your bank account or ten million dollars in your bank account. When you're black, you're black. And when some people, that's all they see. And if, if not speak out, then what? What, what are we supposed to do? Well, you you the- no, we done. We done with that. <laughs> You bring up the, the black, you're black, right? And I love that you mentioned it that way because when you're talking about how it gets used in this film, like early on, that, that first horse ride in the town, that whole thing mm. that's going on. And, and, and Claudia was like new to this type. And I'm saying, bringing that up because we had this discussion after we first watched the movie. Uh, you know, she's, she's asking me in the scene, she's like, what the fuck's going on? I was like, black people aren't supposed to ride horses in parts of the South. And she's like, what? And so, yeah, there were actual laws that stipulated that black people could not ride on the back of a horse. You could ride on a buckboard. You could, you know, ride a carriage. But you were not supposed to be riding a horse because of the power dynamic. And it was this idea of having a having to look up to a black man on a horse is really what it came down to. It was a power thing. It was a social thing. It was, you know, it's a white supremacy thing. I'm like, hey, you're not going to do something that's going to put me in a in a subservient or lower position than you. Uh, but right. no, just j- just the way in which there's this reaction to Jamie Foxx at these different points where it's like, I'm looking at Jamie Foxx through white eyes with this, with this lens that's being presented, right? Or you right. get to Big Daddy's house and then all the slaves are looking at or the enslaved people are looking at him like, what the fuck is going on here? Because that's their reaction to seeing him and then Benita makes that comment where she says, oh, you know, you're if you're a free man, why do you dress like that? Even the idea of the fact that if you're a black and enslaved, there's a way that you're supposed to look. But if you're black and free, you're not supposed to look anything like that. And it wasn't until I, I might have noticed it before, but this time I noticed it and, and, and noted it, that when they first go into the haberdashery, it's so quick as far as the sign that's on the wall. So quick you can miss it. It says house nigger and servant uniforms on the wall, on the outside wall. Huge. And it's letting you know. Yep, no, I've, I'm, Dewan, don't, I've watched this movie countless times and I never noticed the sign. It, you know, it says specifically that that's where he's allowed to buy clothing from. And the fact that he was buying, you know, he was buying a valet's uniform. You know, he was buying an attendant's uniform. And that was the question, like, why the fuck are you dressed like that if you're free? That was the only place where he could buy those clothes or buy clothing in that town. And it only catered to a certain type of employee, I guess is the best you can, best way you can put it. Yeah, I totally missed that. It makes a lot more sense, though. Like it makes the, those parts and how how that interacts. That line was like a throwaway. I took it as a throwaway line, but it makes a lot more sense now. No, but it, it's 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 even even like the the idea of being able to choose your clothing, right? Because I always focused on that one before when he's saying like, "You mean I can choose? You know, I can wear whatever I want." And then and we as an audience, we see it in the blue suit. So like, oh, okay. He's buying his first pair, of, you know, his buying his first suit. So I look at it two different ways. It's one, I'm free, but I'm trying to play this ruse, right? But also, I'm free and I can choose what the fuck I want. 
and we often run into folks where like I, I love the the beach body movement or the beach body positivity movement where it's like hey you know do you have a beach i'm sorry do you have a body are you going to the beach congratulations you have a beach body where some people wouldn't make that comment of like you know oh my gosh you know your size or your shape or whatever why are you wearing this or why are you wearing that and the the simplest answer is because i can because i want to so don't look down on me because i'm choosing to embrace these things or in the case of Django, I, I look at it even with a third lens. You're going to fucking see me. I'm not going to blend in. I'm not going to blend in. I'm not going to go and become walk. You are going to fucking see me. So those times when he chooses his costume to wear, I mean, it, it's, it blows you away as far as how well he does the, you're not going to not see me. You're not going to pay attention to him, even when they have to be at the Cleopatra Club. His his job is to kind of fit in. He's like, no, fuck you. I'm gonna I'm gonna stand over here. I'm gonna talk to white people. I'm gonna do. I'm gonna drink whatever I want to drink. I'm gonna I'm gonna smoke at the bar, and I'm even gonna go so far as to tell you know other another white man like you're not supposed to wear your your house in the hat. I'm sorry, so wear your hat in the house. Like just the subtle shit of like, no, fuck you. I'm gonna, I'm gonna take up space in this room. I tell my kids because you know, especially raising biracial kids, it's important that I kind of prepare them without scaring them. Mm -hmm. And I remind my kids all the time, I'm like, you belong in whatever room you find yourself in. If you find mm -hmm. yourself in a room, you belong in that room. Act like you belong in that room. You walk in, you walk in with your head high, uh, your head held high, because that room is a room you're supposed to be in. If it wasn't, you wouldn't have been there. Exactly. Exactly. Well, oh, I did skip over one thing. Uh, that whole, the whole, I mean, just the absurdity of, of slavery is one thing, right? Just the idea of owning somebody. But the absurdity of American chattel slavery goes even deeper because whether it's discussed in school or not, I'm going to discuss it here. Um, chattel slavery becomes a thing in the 17th century because of legal cases. And, and these are British legal cases that determine that if you're black um, and well, I'm sorry, if you are enslaved and you're black, that is a position of lifelong servitude. It's no longer indentured servitude by the by the 1650s because of these cases. But if you're a woman and you happen to be enslaved, your children will adopt the status of the mother. So whatever the mother's status is, slave or in free, uh, slave enslaved or free, your child is now going to be enslaved or free and the property of the person who owns you. So they don't own just you. They own anything that comes out of your body that they can make money off of. Uh, and sometimes anything on your body that can be made, fun, made uh, money out of, which is which is weird because we have this this weird what are known as the five senses of, of around blackness or around segregation and things like that. The idea that you can you can see, you can smell, uh, you can hear, you can touch and you can taste. All five of these things, you don't want black people to be able to, you, you don't want to have that relationship with black people if you're a white person, unless you have to. Things will be tolerated. So being able to see you, tolerated. You being able to touch me, not tolerated. Definitely not tasting, you know, because we're not, well, there's a different discussion that gets involved there. But this is not an Army Hammer film. Yeah. Whole whole and, show, and here. <laughs> Are like those other things. So in the in the South, it becomes that tolerated thing where um, there's even a phrase that gets used in the 19th and 20th century where if, if you're if you're black in the South, you can get to you can get close. I'm sorry, you can get too close, but you can't get too high. In the North, you can get high, but you can't get too close. So as far as like you can elevate your your social standing, your your income, your 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 personal worth, things like that. Even politically, you can hold some type of office, but don't live near us. And in the South, is like, you can live near us, 
but you better not think that you're better. And that's why you would have those things like those, those, those horse riding laws, things like that, or even jobs with certain occupations. So for the, for the majority of those Southerners, they're fine with seeing and hearing, but all those other things, they don't want to be around you. So we're going to separate you based off of, you know, we don't want to smell you. So we're going to give you different living quarters, even if it's living quarters that we will never be in. We are not going to have a hotel that's going to cater to white and black. So when, you know, King Schultz or Doc King Schultz and Django are traveling, that's why they're camping out. They are not allowed to stay in hotels together because the perception of a black man taking one of these hotel rooms or one of these rooms would damn that hotel forever. Yeah. Just because that one person happened to stay there, this place is now not okay for white people to go to. And no one, no white business owner is really going to, at this time especially, is going to risk their livelihood to make a statement or just to be a nice guy. <laughs> Even the way they connect this, like, you got to think about the, the timing of this. Django and, and Broomhilda, his wife, have not been separated that long. I mean, it's, it's very, it's, it's made very clear that, that Dr. King Schultz gets there, like, after, to find Django. He gets there, like, recently after he had been sold. And recently after they've both been sold, they're going different directions uh, as far as Tildy and, and, and Django. But the idea that Django is, is a married enslaved person and this white man wants to help him out in this time period as far as like restoring this sense of family, restoring this identity, but then also, you know, living out a cultural legend or taking part in a cultural legend. I like that that added story because I feel like that became the Django Unchained became like an allegory of sorts, like a like a play off of that legend of mm -hmm. Brunhilde. I was like, as you look at it, Hildy was Hildy, but Siegfried was Django. Mm -hmm. And as you look at the whole movie, it's like you added this little story in there so that you could see that your whole movie is basically the telling of this story in the mm -hmm. frame of chattel slavery in the 1800s in USA. And then Schultz play, basically plays like narrator and facilitator of, of, of the legend, more or less. He also helps Django become Django. Like, like he's the one that trains him and, you know, makes sure that we know where his wife is and like, He's so instrumental in all of this. And and that is actually a question I had for each of you. Mm -hmm. There's the whole white savior thing going on, right? But like, is it like, does this classify as a white savior? Because he's not the one doing it, but he's absolutely instrumental. So where is that line? And please actually explain white savior to our listeners in case they don't know. Well, White Savior is a documentary about America's adherence to white Christianity. And e oh, you mean an actual? Okay, my bad. I was going to film synopsis. Uh, <laughs> you have two things, or at least two tropes that you typically would see in a lot of movies like this. You got the sacrificial Negro, you know, the the person who sac lays down their life for a white person, right? That 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 becomes a trope as far as like. I'm either going to sacrifice myself for you or something that you need. And then you have the, the white savior and the white savior is typically the, the, the individual Christoph Waltz character. And I hate using him in the, as a character for this one um, that does whatever they can to help a black person out with no reward, no payback, no, no nothing. And all they're really there is to make sure that this, this black person succeeds. You know, and, and even take an agency away from him. Uh, so I would I would argue against Christoph Waltz being or Waltz being a white savior because it's he doesn't really gain anything from it other than living out some some cultural duty, right? But he's not uncommon because uh, Christoph Waltz's character you could argue is kind of like John Brown. He's not an ally; he's an accomplice, and. Early on, he even makes that comment where he's like, I feel so, you know, uh, conflicted here because I have this horrible 
view on slavery, but I, if I don't, if I have you as a slave, I can get, I can get to the Karukan brothers. Or, I'm sorry, I can get to the Brittle brothers. Um, mm. So even the idea of like, I don't even want to use you for this, like as a ruse. That's how bad I feel about this entire institution. And he sees this moment of, yeah, Hildy and and Django are now free, but what the fuck about everybody else? What about everybody else? I mean, he serves as a catalyst to, to bring in Candy down or Candy Land down. But I don't think it's an issue of he takes the agency away from Django to do that because Django still gets his just desserts. Because the real person, the real villain of this movie is not Calvin Candy. It's Steven. Because as long as Steven is alive, Candyland is going to operate the way it's been working. And, and, and Steven even makes that comment about like, I've seen all types of shit done to people here. Like I've been here for 70 something years and being there for 70 something years, he figured out how to make the plantation work for his benefit where he can talk shit like openly talk shit to, yeah. to Calvin Candy and correct that him. Shocked me. And I'm going to say this. I have no reservations about this. There are examples of enslaved people doing this. Not many. But there are examples of enslaved people who basically were at a certain age where it's like, the fuck am I going to do to George? Like, he's 90. Why am I going to beat a 90-year-old man or a 90-year-old slave? And they just they just trumped it up to, you know, this. he does piss me off, but he gets stuff done for me. He's the one who facilitates everything. You see him signing over payments for stuff. Like, Stephen is the one who's in charge. But Django's story is, is not against Calvin Candy. It's against Django. I'm sorry. It's, a, it's against uh, it's against Steven. And you see that when they first meet because you initially think it's going to be him and, and Calvin Candy's character. But the, the real, I, I guess, repartee, the great competition that you have is between he and Steven. And yeah. the idea of blackness being weaponized against other black people for the purpose of this system Um but I also love the fact that it's based off of Clarence Thomas, which makes it even better. That seems semi-relevant today. Yeah, I mean, there are a lot of people who would sell their own mothers down the road. Yeah, at least our house. Um, but no, um, I would have to agree with just about all of that. Um, I don't see... I, I see Schultz as a... To use the word, a catalyst. Like he facilitates... Django becoming Django, you mm-hmm. know, mm-hmm. he facilitated. It. I don't think that he was trying to to be a white savior. I think he was more of a reflection on like through Schultz's viewpoint. We can see how, if you weren't part of that system, how you viewed that system. He was appalled at the idea of. It's like I need you to be free so you can help me with the thing, but I have to buy you, so that's weird. So then you get a bill of sale from the guy just shot. Um, let me figure that out. And so it's like it's just the way things go. And it's like I need your help, and I feel like you'd help me, but it makes it a lot easier for you to help me if I own you and you kind of have to sort of. But understand that you're not really a slave, but you're still kind of a slave, but not really a slave. And then once this is all done, I'm, you're going to be free. And and then, like you said later on, there's like, ah, like I could let you go to Greensville, but I just don't. Mm, I've never given anybody their freedom before, so I feel kind of obligated to you. Like he doesn't want to save Django; he just wants to make sure Django is able to go and do the things that Django needs and wants to do because he recognizes that these systems are still in place, and they're still going mm-hmm. to impact Django. He's like, I believe in your message. I believe in your journey. And even with the allegory of, of the legendary story of my people, my German people, you know, I, I understand that without the, without being accompanied by a white person, without having a white person with you, you're screwed in this. Mm-hmm. Because I can believe in you all damn day. You can show off and be as great at this thing as you know as you want to be. No one out there is going. No one in Greensville is going to give a damn about you being free and me whatever. No one's going to care. 
They're just gonna capture you and enslave you all over again. It's gonna be a waste of time. So let me roll with you. Well, yeah, because even at this time, you're talking about the 1850s, like all those laws, especially Fugitive Slave Act, um, the, what should I say, the, the second and third one, uh, the Fugitive Slave Act in, in 1850 as part of the, the California Compromise, it's like it doesn't give protections to black people anywhere. I mean, you could no. be a free and free black person, never enslaved. Somebody goes north and claim, and a slave catcher goes north and claims that you were their slave, Jim, or or the slave of the person that they're representing. You have no recourse, and then you have the the Dred Scott decision in '57 that makes it even worse, where it says like white people don't have to respect any rights of black people because black people are not eligible for citizenship, and as a result, they don't have rights that everybody else has. So they yeah, can't do shit. We weren't people. Exactly. Like, we weren't we weren't people yet. And you know, by the time we when we first became quote unquote people, we were only what three fifths of people. <laughs> we were only three feet, and that only and that was just to benefit them in Congress. That, that's it. That just, okay, I gotta I gotta tell you what I did to a friend of mine. I can't remember. Oh, good God, that should uh, remind you of anything. No, it, it should. <laughs> Uh, because James knows the feelings I have about like early Republic America, early America, Fourth of July. I've never heard you mention it. Okay, friend of mine posted. It was it was like out of uh, uh, like Williamsburg, Virginia. It was like that type of setup. Was like, oh, come get some ice cream for whatever, whatever. It was like the the independent special. So he put up the thing. He's like, oh man, I can't wait to try some of this. And I put on uh, as far as my comment is like. I'd love to try it, but I think they don't allow me to have three fifths of it. <laughs> I'm like, whenever I see that much red, white, and blue, I get very suspicious. I'm like, As what's going should. on here? I just start That's laughing cool. at people, and I'm just like, if it's, I tell this to my wife. We were driving, we were walking through the uh, grocery store and looking at the, all the Fourth of July stuff they have out now, and I'm like, see if it has stars on it. Because if it doesn't have stars, I'm just going to say it's French. And that's going to piss off American like patriots ten times to Sunday. And you're like, oh no, this is American. I'm like, no, no, that's French. No, I'm celebrating it's, Bastille Day. It's, it's America. It's red, white, and blue. I'm like, uh huh. And that's the French flag. Do you see a star on this cupcake? No. Then it's French. You enjoy that. You enjoy that cupcake, Frenchman. <laughs> Happy Independence. <laughs> you can thank us for it. <laughs> I laugh because the city of Louisville, where I'm from, was named after Louis the Sixteenth. You're all welcome. <laughs> Don't tell them that. <laughs> oh, I'm telling. I tell everybody that <laughs> because in town, you have you know the way we we typically say the town is Louisville. We don't like mm-hmm. to use our tongues here for speech, and and I'm like, no, no, no. technically it's Louisville because we were named after a French king, and 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 no one likes to hear that when I say that. You know, one of my favorite moments in wrestling, because everything comes back to wrestling. Everything goes back to wrestling. It was back during the uh, the five-second pose of Edge and Christian. And they had Angle with them, and they were in your lovely city. And mm. uh, and Christian announced it as Louisville. And just watching the crowd react has stuck with me all these years. That's what, like 20 years ago? And I Probably. still just I they did like a jug band and had like like really bad fake teeth they put in oh, and stuff. God and, damn, that was oh that was a and oh my deal. god, man! Like and yeah. I just I still remember that one. And I was a huge Edge and Christian fan, and that one I can't remember like, if that was a Raw so or Judgment Day. I think it was a pay per view. Yeah, it was Judgment. Yeah, that was the opening of Judgment Day to uh, two thousand. <clears throat> So, so I have this problem every single time we do Imaginarium where I want to say Louisville so bad and pronounce the S, and I have to literally talk myself out of it every single year that I go. Well, so I, I appreciate share that. Because there are plenty, yeah. of, there are other, like there's a Louisville, Colorado, but there's yeah. a Louisville, Kentucky, and, you know, but it's Louisville. Yeah. You you got to do it like Bridget Fonda's character in uh, Jackie Brown. That's how you have to say it. Lewis Ville. Lewis. Where's so, the car, Lewis? 
So I have another legit question. Okay. Um, so you've kind of talked about Steven's position a little bit and, and what it was called. And, uh, and then we have Django being an, a person, a black person helping buy black people or buying them himself. I don't know how it exactly works. Um, so I believe Django makes a comment like, they hate me more than they hate you or something to that mm -hmm. effect, something I'm worse than you are. And yep. I was wondering if you could speak to first what Steven's position actually means, because although we hear it, I don't feel like uh, we get a, get an actual explanation like in school and stuff, obviously, but, mm -hmm. but I feel like it's very important. And then also somebody in Django's supposed position, like, you know, just just what those two positions mean and uh, the reality of them, if you would. Oh, man. James coming with the hot questions here. I know, right. I'm actually doing a good job for once instead of just making shitty jokes all day. Oh, my God. <laughs> uh, but Steven's character is 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 basically head of the house and yeah. and he controls the the house staff as far as you know just managing what's going to be taking place that's why he even makes those comments I, you know when he's trying to create a distraction about like oh you know i'm the one who's in charge and if something gets fucked up around here you're going to come to me and i'm going to be getting in trouble for it because really and an and enslaver is not talking to all their slaves if they're talking to any slave it's whatever slave has been given a position of power and and talking to that one person, you're limiting, you know, those five senses as far as like seeing, hearing, smelling, touching black people, being around black people. And you're not directly addressing any of them either. It's like, oh, you know, tell the, the Negroes in the kitchen to do this or tell them out in the field to do this. Or um, he is the he is the point of contact. And the that's a I can't fault a character like Steven for doing that because you're doing it out of survival. Yeah. You understand that this is not a system that is going to work. I'm sorry. It's not going to benefit you to be an individual and, and, and I'm sorry, an individual who stands up against the system. It will benefit you as an individual who helps support the system. But if you're standing against the system, it's not going to work for you because one, you're an old black man at one point, a young black man, but an old black man in Mississippi, and for those who don't know, yes, every time you cross in the state line into Mississippi, those letters scroll across uh, your windshield uh, to remind you that you're in Mississippi. Because uh, that was—is it like a was warning honest. or kind of? <laughs> it's a it's a new feature on all Teslas. Um, Tesla drivers can't read. Then they start speaking to you in 1930s German, and you're like, "Oh my god, this is really good." They have all the Hitler speeches downloaded Car. onto it. God damn it. All right, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> all right. But with Django's character, the idea of somebody who's going to actively participate in this system, and this is not the same, because I want to say this for any of the incels and assholes out there. The vast majority of black people who bought other enslaved black people did it for the purpose of freeing those black people because the only way in which they could legally free them was to buy them and take them to a court of law to give freedom papers to them. If you want to argue with this, argue with James, not with me. I've already written stuff about it and I got to send it somewhere. Um, I've done my argue with research. me, but I'm just going to like do something else and not listen. I know. I've, I've done my own research. With Exactly. But but the thing is, like so many of those were done for, to save their family, like save a wife, save, you know, they found a child, they offered money, paid for that person. Spouse, same situation, long lost family member, same situation. They find somebody and they have the means they're going to buy their freedom because that means that they're going to be safe or safer, safer at that point. Yeah. But the actual an actual black slaver, there were very few. But the, th the reason why they're so despised, because the understanding is you understand what the system is. Those kingdoms of West Africa did not understand what chattel slavery was, not excusing them for anything that they did. But the system of slavery that you had in sub-Saharan Africa and, and, of course, North Africa, not even close to what, what was going on with the, the triangle trade system, the Atlantic slavery system. But a person like Django, as far as what he's portraying, 
is the worst of the worst because they don't have whiteness, but they exude whiteness as far as that power dynamic that's there, being able to talk to enslaved people that, or I'm sorry, not being able to, just talk in the way that they do to enslaved people, treating enslaved people that way because the, the understanding is, at least with, within this, this, this system and within this culture is, why would you do that to your own people? Why would you continue doing this? Why would you participate? Because a slaver, a black slaver is bad, as bad as you can be. But you find people within that world that figure out how to navigate this, like Sheba. Sheba's character just kind of gets brushed over so many times. But the fact that, she, that, that she's just as bad as a slaver because she's benefiting from all this shit as an enslaved black woman or possibly free because, I mean, may, she might be free. Calvin might have freed her as his sex slave, as, as, as his you know, uh, as a former sex slave and decided like, oh, no, I want to keep her for me. I'm going to free her and she's going to be my woman because I'm going to take care of her. Um, I but she gets, she gets dependent on this. Oh, yeah, I know. Because <laughs> I think he's fucking a sister. But he gets, she's so dependent on the system. He's so it's absolutely. not just me then. He was no, definitely fucking a sister. Oh, absolutely. Oh, the, what you get is, is another... I, I'm going to give Tarantino credit for this. I think it's a dig at the South and this whole idea of refinement and, and making that thing of like, you know what? The people who are running this were a bunch of, you know, inbred, incestuous fucks. And fuck them. They're horrible people. And we should make fun of them. Um, but somebody like Sheba, it's the idea of you know how bad this system is. And what, even knowing how bad it is, I have different thoughts in my head when Django, you know, goes to the bar and she sees him, she grabs the champagne and she walks away from him. I see that in so many ways where it's either game recognizes game. You know, I know what you're here for. I'm here for, to, for survival as well. It's I don't want to be around him because I'm better than him. Or two, I'm sorry, three, Jesus. Or three, it's you mean nothing to me. I'm a white woman. You know, as far as like, that's, that's the identity I've accepted because look at my clothing, look at the meals I'm able to eat, look at the company I'm able to keep. And there's never anything said to me by anybody other than Calvin. And it's just Calvin wants me around because I'm pretty. Yeah. There's, there's a lot of comparison. We, we, we brought up a lot of the characters and there's a lot of uh, general uh, comparisons. There's a lot. There's that. There's that mindset that we have active today, where you know when you have people who've never had, you know, stuff, money, or whatever like that. The moment that they get it, the first thing they want to do is imitate those they mm. see with it. That's right. that's their impression of status. If that's if this period of time, we're talking kings. We're talking. The European royalty and a mm -hmm. lot of the, like the Calvin, the Calvins and the Loras, they're they're imitating essentially their kings of their castle, their large mansions on their plantation, and they're, they're trying to best that they can emulate these palaces from from Europe, like Versailles or whatever, or Versailles. Sorry, in Kentucky we have Versailles, Kentucky. <laughs> It's a, it's a, it's a trap. But no, we have those kinds of situations where like they're just imitating. So when you have the Shivas and the Jangos, Jango's playing a role, but Django and Steven and Shiva, you know, they are imitating what they've seen in status. Mm -hmm. You know, when you say that she was basically like, well, I'm a white woman, as far as she's concerned. Being a white woman had nothing to do with the color of her skin. It has to do right. with the status that's attached to that. And Stephen, like we've mentioned before, he's in it for survival, but he's done it for so long and gotten so comfortable that while he still knows his place, he still wants to imitate the, the point of status with everybody but Calvin. Right. Because Calvin is still his master, but as far as everybody else is concerned, hey, you ain't gonna, you're, you're not gonna look sideways to me. 
I bring a small, uh, just uh, just a reflection when I saw the, the seven people walking back to the house after Calvin's funeral towards the end of the movie. They're all walking side by side. Mm -hmm. We were talking about the uh, not wanting to get too close and you have them the the uh, house manager. We'll call him the house manager. Um, yeah, like that's why you had the Wranglers on 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 the plantation. That's why you had hired other people to do all that dirty work for you. You're like, mm -hmm. I'm not going to do all that. No, I am in this position of king, and you're going to view me in this position of king. You're going to view me in this 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 royal image. You're gonna you're gonna see me for my status, and you're gonna respect my status. And as you are in your Stevens or in your Sheba's position, you are going to want to do the best you can to imitate what you've seen status as. And we still do that today. Yeah, you find some folk who never had no money. You get you know all those TV shows about how I lost my money in the lottery or whatever. As soon as they got some money, first thing they want to do buy a bunch of houses. Pass money out like it's candy. People start getting record deals. First thing they do, buy sixteen cars. Mm -hmm. I think like Cardi B has like six, ten cars and doesn't drive. Not she doesn't drive those cars. She doesn't drive. Right. <laughs> wow. And it, yeah, I saw her in an interview. She's like, I, I got this kind of car, this kind of car, this kind of car. It's always the Lamborghinis and the Maseratis and the the Porsches or whatever, and it's like, I don't drive. Oh, you mean you have a driver for you? Like, no, no, no. I don't drive. I don't have a license. I don't drive. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's just because that's what you that's what you've seen. That's what you think having money is like, and that's that's what is being imitated, you know, in life today and in, and in the movie in those positions. You know, there, there's those memes that say how the rich behave and how the very rich behave. Everyone right. who's, you know, it's just, it's imitation. It's all, it's all trying to play a role. Everyone there is trying to play a role. No one's genuine to themselves, except for probably Schultz and mm -hmm. Jenga. Probably the most genuine people in that whole movie. Well, I want to, I want to make it clear. Uh, when I win the lottery, you won't know. There'll be signs, but you won't fucking know. You already we have a world title around your waist. We know, dude. <laughs> Where were you last week? Um, first off, <laughs> um, yes, for those of you who are listening, I just came back from Greece and Italy and Croatia as well. Um, no, we, we get our, well, I'm sorry for anybody who doesn't know. Uh, Go to the, if you're a gambler, just go to the casinos and play at the casinos, and you'll basically start getting free cruises all the time. Um, so we, we're getting pretty cheap. You just, we're getting, you just we're got your doctorate. Cheap. You deserved every single bit we're of that. Man, by the way, congratulations! On, Thank you. On and, oh, oh, and I guess I can announce this on this episode. Uh, I did win Royal Caribbean Sexiest Man in the World um, Award. I did abdicated you know? the. I no, I abdicated the title. I abdicated the title. <laughs> To an 85 year old man, because they're like, we're, the winner was like, no, fuck it. He said he's 85. Give him the title. <laughs> like, I don't care. I'm not going to upstage an 85 year old man who one had the courage to come out here and do this and then, you know, dance with every last one of the contestants. I mean, the, uh, if you're six is man alive and people are mistaking you for me, hey, man, use it. Use I'm going to take it. Use I'm it. Take I it. I was still getting on the uh, on the like Claudia was not there. I know this is sidetrack and everything. Claudia wasn't there. It was I got roped into it because the uh, the cruise director. I'm walking back from the bar. I'm going to my room. She's like, "You're gonna be in the you're gonna be in the world sexiest man competition." And I thought she was telling me she was asking me. And I said, "Oh, okay." And I just <laughs> stood there and I. And I yeah, I mean, it, I, I use the drink package. I, you know, I, I get my money's worth in the drink package. So I texted Claudia. I'm like, yeah, apparently I'm in the sexiest man competition. So come out. So I went out there, did my thing. I, I ended up squatting the cruise director um, like several times because that's what I do when I've had a couple. And I completely <laughs> forget that times. I have. Yeah, I completely forget about my broken neck and, and back until the next day. I'm like, why can't I move? Um, so... <laughs> So anyway, uh, yeah, the 
Icy actually, Icy was the cruise director. She actually yelled at one of the one of the judges because two judges gave me a ten, one gave me an eight. She's like, an eight? Are you really going to give him an eight? What is wrong with you? And I was like, are you fucking kidding me? The cruise director's pissed. <laughs> yeah, Claudia, I, Claudia was about to whoop somebody's ass that day. Um, you know, what? Remember. she she kept waiting for it to show up on the TV, and I kept waiting too. And I was like, I don't know if you want to see it because I don't remember anything I did. You want to know what I'm excited about? So what? if Don is sexiest man, and you're confused for Don, that makes you hot as well. And then I'm going to hang out with you, and the cheerleader effect kicks in. And uh, that makes uh, me hot. Woohoo! I thought you were gonna make an Oreo joke because we'll stand together and you'll be like, wow. There's, there's no? no racism for me on this episode, Mike. I thought he was gonna make the Oreo <laughs> joke. I thought he's gonna be like, if you're on this side and you're on this side, does that make this the world Look, sexiest what, Oreo? What we what we <laughs> want to do in our spare time is between us. The listeners don't need to know about that. All right. <laughs> he's already the white guy on the Shingo episode. He's yes, as the minority the voice Oreo. on this episode, I just want to say. Oreo. <laughs> well, thank you for being the cream filling, James. Why does everyone call me that? Anyway, uh, no, I want to bring it back to Schultz. I, I have a legit thing I want to say. Okay. Uh, one of the big complaints about this movie is always the excessive violence and how Tarantino always does this and blah, blah, blah. Number one, I want to say I love the violence in this. I adore the violence in this because it's almost Sam Raimi-esque, but not quite hitting it. Like some of these shots where like body parts are exploding, they're just so fucking fun. And my personal favorite part, Don, I'll ask you later what your favorite part of this movie is, but my personal favorite part is say goodbye to Miss Laura. And just the way that Laura goes flying into the next room is so fucking fantastic, right? But all these complaints about the violence and whatever else, I have this theory that Schultz, he understood that slavery was wrong, but I don't think he understood the reality of slavery up close. Right. And I think that we have to experience what Schultz experiences to A, fully understand his arc, and to B... Make us fucking accept it. And and I'm saying white people here as us. To make us fucking look at this and watch it and make it uneasy and unbearable and not sugarcoat anything in Candyland, which I think is why it's called Candyland, but that's me. I think it's a terrible joke. But to make us really watch this Mandingo fight up close and you see how fucking uncomfortable Schultz is. And when we see D'Artagnan get taken down... And Django refused to stop it. We have to witness the brutality and the reality with Schultz. And taking taking any of that away would fucking kill this movie for me. All right, go ahead. Okay, I got okay. So that is absolutely valid because as he's sitting there after the ruse is exposed at the end, when he's sitting alone with his own thoughts, you know. The ruse is now over. The character is broken. They've gotten them basically go to get what they wanted. And he's sitting there listening to Fairlease on the on the harp. His reflection is is the memory of D'Artagnan being mauled by the dogs. Mm-hmm. That was when he knew about it. But this is like he knew about it before, but that was the moment he knew about it. Like you said, he witnessed it. It was real. It was, like I said, visceral. It was, it it was, it was what slavery was. And even today, as we are, you know, not wanting to teach it and, you know, we're more afraid of how people are going to feel about hearing about it. I'm not, you know, this is, this is that moment is because we have to see it to understand movies like Django Unchained or movies like Roots. You know, it's it's supposed to make you as uncomfortable as possible so that you get the understanding of how terrible things were. And this is still fiction. Mm-hmm. Imagine the reality of it. And I think like you mentioned, Schultz in his and everything you have your in your in your your opinion there, James, 
is reflected in just that moment when he's sitting there with his own thoughts and all he can think about is watching a man being mauled by dogs because that's how Schultz sees it. Candy's looking at him like, oh, you still feel you feel bad because I because I bested you, didn't you? He's like, actually, no, I don't care about that. It's just you 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 mauled a guy to death and you named him D'Artagnan after a character in a black man's book of all things. Mm-hmm. Like to express that irony, to recognize that. And I, I can't help but feel that there's also guilt on Schultz's conscience because he distinctly told Django, you can never break character. For for a wrestling reference, you have to be the undertaker and never break kayfabe. And Spinaroni. Exactly. But no, but, but legitimately, Django does not break character. He says, fucking kill him. I don't know what his exact words were, but but he's like, no, D'Artagnan's got to die. And he just stands there and lets it fucking happen. And, and I, I personally think that Schultz feels responsible for that on some level. He probably does, because in the end, there was an opportunity. He could have said, $500 is all I take. All right, cool. I'll buy him. He's mine now. And then they would have left him alone. But again, don't break character. And he emphasized this. It's like, this is what we're doing. Is, is, is heavy business. It's, it's dark. And sometimes, you know, like the worst that he was talking about before earlier on is like killing a man in front of his child. It's like, hey, it's the business, man. This is just what we, it's what we do. Mm-hmm. And so once you're down there in route to Candyland, you know, Django's like, hey, I'm not breaking candy, uh, character. I'm not breaking kayfabe, essentially. It's like, I know what this is. You don't. Mm-hmm. Here it is. So now you're the one facing the, the, the pain of this. And there is that, uh, that sort of dichotomy where Django had reservations from killing a man in front of his child. And now being confronted with how brutal these, you know, Mandingo fights and the slavery uh, actually can be in these completely mundane moments. Faced with that viscerally, it just, he just, he was stuck on it. And it was, that's why he's not letting it go mentally. He, he can't let that go. He realized he had an opportunity, but it was the character he was forcing Django to portray himself subsequently that allowed for this man to die. I'm I'm with both of you except for the, the blaming Django. And I say that because I think the, the more of the focus is on the fact that kind of what Django says is what, you know, he's like, I'm more I'm used to America. I'm more used to Americans than he is. Uh, when he says that to, to Calvin Candy, they kind of have their stare off while while D'Artagnan is being torn apart. I think it's more an issue of like this is this is the problem with. And I'm, well, I'm not going to pick the American educational system, but I would say the the effect that American nostalgia and misplaced uh, reverence has been on the antebellum period, because even the idea of like, oh, he's my sister, she's a southern girl. I'm like, there weren't southern bells. That's that was a that w- that was some gone with the wind shit. Like that wasn't a thing. You had slave mistresses and house mistresses, but you didn't. No one was like, "Oh, you're southern." But that shit did, did not happen. Anyway, I I de- I declare, I declare, Lacey yeah. Evans was real to me. Okay. Okay. So Lacey anyway, Evans, oh <laughs> <laughs> very sad. Anyway, uh, <laughs> but, but, but even the, the idea that juxtaposition of something beautiful and something ugly, right? Or something peaceful and something violent. So you've got Fiora Lee's playing, which is a beautiful piece of music. And it's it's being overlapped with dogs snarling and chewing and biting at somebody in the screens. But earlier before that, you have another one, which is, again, something that happens very quick. And, it, and for the most part, it takes somebody who knows about this time period of history or has an interest in it to know what the fuck was going on in this one scene. So downstairs when they first get to the Cleopatra Club there's this door that I think Mr. Mogi comes out of and you see people dance, you know, singing and, and, and playing around in a room. 
and it, it's it's what's known as a quadroon ball. And basically what happened in places like New Orleans, even Philadelphia, Charleston, uh, and I think in, even in Mobile. So a lot of port cities or cities that had a, a vibrant community or at least uh, a community of, of mulatto people or at least deemed mulatto uh, and, and beyond as far as Octoroon and Quadroon, things like that. What these were is they were meet and greets or what would be our equivalent of speed dating. And I, and I use dating in a very loose terminology because even if you were a, a free black woman of color in New Orleans, which there was a very high proportion of them in New Orleans, even if you were, you still didn't have that much agency when it came to your life. So you had to find benefactors. And a lot of these slavers and white businessmen loved them some chocolate. Love them. And, and and I am not joking. I'm not exaggerating. Court records are hilarious. I mean, it, looking back on them, because I have an ancestor who was so in love with his enslaved woman that he threatened to kill his own children. He was so in love with her. And he was not going to be denied Marguerite. He was going to keep having her. And he didn't give a shit about their mom. Like their mom was dead and buried. He's like, oh, I want I want Marguerite. That's the woman for me. Ended up getting her pregnant four times because he's like, I can't get enough of her. Uh, so anyway, you have these moments that are represented like the Mandingo Ball, where it's I'm here. I'm an 18 or younger uh, girl. And there are these older white men who want to be my benefactor or be my my oh god i forgot the legal term but basically be my husband without being legally recognized as my husband because for appearances and for purposes i have to have a white wife but i could have my other wife in the city of new orleans so if i happen to live you know i don't know in baton rouge or i live somewhere else away from new orleans new orleans is where i come to do business and do my fuckery and at home is where all my business as far as like my slave business is so you had those taking place on that on that first floor where we get to was the Mandingo fights that are held upstairs. And you have this brutality, at least this the sense of beauty and calm and peace and whatever taking place at the ground floor. But upstairs is where the nefarious shit is taking place. And it's 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 human dog fighting. I mean, that's the that's the best way you can you can encapsulate is human dog fighting and even a movie like. Um, Mandingo, the movie Mandingo with, with Ken Norton Sr., they didn't really get into this that much. They made it seem like, oh, all he did was fight people and win. He fought people and won. When the punishment, which gets revealed in this movie, but it gets downplayed because uh, it's more about him having sex with a white woman than anything else. No, I'm sorry, the way, the way the movie sold. That this was something that was a fight to the death. You had no choice. And the fact that you had to kill another enslaved person for your own survival, like the direct link of I have to do this, I have no choice, as opposed to somebody like Stephen or Sheba, where somebody may get hurt by their decision, might not get hurt by their decision, and their decision is being coaxed by somebody else on top of them. And maybe the decision that you that you hand out assists in your survival, but it doesn't ensure your survival. Whereas here, the only way you're going to survive and to survive in the system is you got to kill other black enslaved people and the indignity that somebody is making you both do this. And you don't get any reward. I mean, maybe you get a beer, maybe you get some sex, but the idea is there is nothing, there's no financial reward. There's no agency for you uh, either at that point or afterwards, because I guarantee you there's no, there's no, you know, aftercare program or healthcare plan for any of these individuals who are maimed and severely injured. There's no healthcare now. <laughs> Jesus Christ. It's true. I, I was going to ask you, because you are the historian. This is, this is kind of your thing. So I, I was talking to, this, to, to James about this before. I had a friend of mine who was very upset uh, when she watched this movie the first time because of how mm-hmm. brutal particularly the Mandingo fights were. And she's under the impression that the Mandingo fights were just a figment of uh, Tarantino's sick fantasies or whatnot. Well, no, they were not. That shit was horrible. Like, yeah. 
the the descriptions oh, and then the and the medical experimentation on people who lost their like the ones who didn't die, the medical mm-hmm. experimentation on them, and then the the fact that you would still I mean you'd have enslavers not every time obviously, but you'd have enslavers that would sell parts of their bodies to people after they were because they were still looking for a way to make money off of them. But yeah, that yeah, anybody who believes that Mendingo fights were just this idea of you know, I, I guess on the same level as Tarantino's obsession with feet uh, is wrong <laughs> because that should actually happen. Oh, I'm sorry. I forgot the thing I did want to include, James. When you were mentioning, when well, both of you mentioned King Schultz and the, the whole idea of D'Artagnan, it's, it's one showing what somebody's viewpoint is who hasn't, one, been, like you pointed out, hasn't been exposed to the system of slavery and the, and the horrors of slavery. But this is also a reflection of what people are go- going through at this time, whether it's a realization through um, the Liberator, uh, uh, William Wood Garrison's paper, uh, whether it is even something like uh, Harry Beecher Stowe's Uncle Tom's Cabin talking about the horrors of slavery. Like this is something that a lot of people are ignoring because, one, it doesn't affect them directly. So why should they care? Or in the case of, of like labor in the Northeast, the idea that, oh, yeah, they got it bad, but we got it bad, too. Yeah, we know this bad stuff is happening, but nobody's standing up for us. Um, as well as modern American audiences, and I, specifically modern American audiences, who still don't know that much about slavery to the point, we're not picking on your fan, Duan, but the, the fact that people to this day don't know how bad shit was even stuff that you would look at and, and, and think of being as trivial, like Mandingo fights or or even mulatto balls, because somebody would look at it and say, oh, that's a great idea. That's a great way to get out of the system. Like, no, you're still in the fucking system because your yeah. safety and security is dependent on a white benefactor making sure that you're taken care of. Now, there are a lot of women who made a lot of money and had a lot of power as a result of these arrangements, but it's still not something that you can actively choose to participate in or just actively leave without leaving the entire the entirety of the United States because you're still going to be at, at um, oh shit. You're, you're still going to you're still going to have to deal with whatever comes as a result of policy foreign less so than you would with it if it's domestic yeah yeah no 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 it's one of it, it is a reflection of a lot of factors of uh, in my in my view, uh, but one of the things that it's a reflection of we, we we've mentioned it a couple of times in passing some of it in in, in in jest is just the education when it comes to this period of time mm-hmm. because of lost cause because of people you know they don't want to look at like you said before they don't want to look at their family a certain way I have this story from when I worked at the gas station. This guy would come into my gas station once or twice a week. Motorcycle guy came in wearing a helmet. He would come in. And he had like this almost intentionally perfect diction. He would he would make sure he enunciated his words properly. May I please have a pack of and he ordered cigarettes. And it took a few times for him to come through, but I would look at the helmet and I realized the helmet had a falcon and a, and a swastika on the front of it. Oh, <laughs> and so I'm like observing this. I mind you, white guy, black guy, late night. I'm like, okay, when's a good safe time for me to bring this up? Because I'm me. I have to ask. Right. And at one point, I said, "So, if you don't mind me asking," he's like, "Yes." Um. So again, his words were very intentional. I'm like, the helmet. He's like, oh, it was a great. It was my grandfather's. He was German. Get the fuck out of it. So. Now, anyone knows about World War II knows that not, you, you didn't exactly join Hitler's army by choice. Right. So I try to give as much of a pass as you can give someone in that circumstance, um, which isn't a lot. But when you look at this, you have to look at the guy. Now, now mind you, I, I feel it's important for me to know the man never said a crossword to me. He never looked at me sideways. He always treated me with the utmost respect. That being said, he is still wearing a Nazi swastika on his helmet every single day that he came into my store. 
Now, if he wore that because it was his grandfather's and he loved his grandfather's and this is something he had of his grandfather's, so it's hard to look past the symbolism when there's that emotional token attached to it. Right. Or if he just said that so he didn't get lynched in the hood at the gas station. Whatever. Either way. It's one of those it's one of those things people have a hard time separating this terrible history mm-hmm. from the their family. There's that Golden Girls episode where oh, Blanche, yeah. where Blanche had the, the rebel flag uh, for the family reunion and there's the black guy that worked there, Don Cheadle, had a mm-hmm. character and he was, and he, uh, he was like, Hey, do you have any idea what this symbolizes? I'm like, yeah, this is my family heritage. This flag's been flown at every uh, family function since I can remember. And they did not connect the two. And I have to believe that somewhere people out there just do not connect the two. All that to be said, that when you don't want to teach how bad things really are, the situation we're looking at with education today, and you don't want to teach how bad things genuinely are, you're going to have people who are going to question whether or not these things actually happen. Because exactly. to them, it is, and again, this is not a reflection of my friend or anyone else who has the same mindset, because I was doing some research beforehand, and there's a lot of people who are saying this is just a Tarantino thing. Um, but it's it's easier on the brain to say this one man by himself is just a sicko, and he just invented this in his mind, than to believe that hundreds of black people were forced into such violent mm-hmm. acts against each other for the sheer entertainment of white people. Right. This is, and it's just that it's that disconnect and that disconnect has caused, you know, error in, in public education. So yeah, it's nor I, I am not surprised that there is so much question. I'm not so surprised that there are people who don't get how bad things really were. It takes Roots, it takes Django, and it takes all these other movies that have, all these other books and movies that have depicted slavery and and um, the civil rights movement and suffrage and to just understand how bad these periods of times were mm-hmm. for different groups of people in our history. Because God bless the USA, you know, you know, everyone wants to believe that we're so star spangled awesome that how dare anything bad happen? We can't do bad things. And because if the country does bad things, it means that you're a bad person. That's how they connect it. And no one wants to think that negatively negatively of themselves. Well, what they need to do is take Sheba's Sheba's quote, and you know, when they're learning this stuff, and say, "I oh, know you didn't mean me." You know, that's the way the approach should be. But it's so much of it gets per, uh, personalized, where it's like bad shit happened. People who look like me were in charge doing it, and if people who look like the people that were offended or assaulted or whatever see me, they're going to immediately think that. I'm like, why the fuck would you think that? Why wouldn't you think it's you know, I don't know, uh, William Lloyd Garrison. Uh, Thaddeus Stevens, John Brown. Why would you think of those people? Why would you immediately think like I'm the one who would be doing all the bad shit? What we do is you should look at the people who did the bad shit, understand what they did, what bad shit they did. And even when it comes to something like slavery, the one thing I will always tell people is however bad you think it was, it was worse. So these Mandingo fights, Tarantino pulled back. There were worse scenes that were supposed to be on, like included in the film, um, and they weren't. Like that whipping scene of of little Jody, you know, breaking the eggs, and the and the and the brittle brothers are beating her. Yeah, that was even more intense than what they filmed. And Tarantino, or at least somebody associated with it, I can't remember. It was Tarantino, it might have been Samuel Jackson, but anyway, I'll give Tarantino the credit. He gave everybody the day off. He's like, no, we we need to. This has been very rough on everybody. This is very stressful. I want, you know, everybody take take the day off and we'll we'll, you know, we'll relax, decompress, come back because people on set were like just horrified. 
at, at what it was. And he kept, kept pointing out as well as other people associated with pointing out, like it was worse than this. This was like a beating. Like he didn't show any rape. He didn't show like the disfigurement of people. Cause even that scene with, with, uh, which is great if it was his choice to do it. We don't see anything D'Artagnan related until like you pointed out until it's through Schultz's eyes which is intentional. It's that whole thing of like, I'm going to make you motherfuckers see this shit. I'm going to make you see this whole, this whole version of it being ignored and overlooked by Candy and, and, and Jingo's character, not necessarily being ignored, but it's not the focal point of their, of their scene. But to have you as John Q public, who's not acquainted with history, not acquainted with this period of history, other than thinking of slavery was bad. Then the civil war happened. Everything got, got okay after that. You now see, like, there is no you can be just okay after this because we never had a Nuremberg moment with 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 slavery during the Reconstruction period. You had some people went to jail. You had some people who lost initially their rights as citizens and and to 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 vote, which I think it should have been permanent and should have been permanent for everybody associated with them. But you know, unfortunately, we had some people who made a corrupt bargain in 1876. But anyway, the fact that we never had a reconciliation moment with regard to slavery is one of the reasons why we can never have a discussion of a, a fruitful discussion about reparations because people automatically go to like, Oh, money, money, money. I'm like, no reparations is all inclusive. It's, it's going back. It's doing all this research to find out where, the, where these enslaved people live, who they were like, like we're doing work at the university of Mississippi that wasn't started until 11 years ago. And they were just seeking out, or since they've been doing the research, I've just been using the research. They, the, the group, the University of Mississippi Slavery Research Group, along with other universities, are now doing all the heavy lifting to find this stuff with a handful of people. And then you have independent uh, historians and, and researchers that are doing stuff when this needs to be like on a grand scale because there are plantations in use to this day that were standing during during the antebellum period and they've turned them into bed and breakfast like i would not that i would ever want to make this joke but i mean imagine if if auschwitz was turned into like disneyland actually never mind fucking disney probably would do it uh imagine if auschwitz happened to, i mean walt disney if auschwitz was turned into like an amusement park or something like it, it's it's the equivalent and what you're doing is you're minimizing the struggle, you're minimizing the pain, you're minimizing the sacrifice, the, the torture that these individuals went through. And, and fortunately, many survive, but they went through and you turn it into like, you know, we're just going to sit, we're going to sit around and sit mint juleps and wear these big dresses and be fancy and, and you know, think and think about how great things used to be, which is why they want to make, you know, things great again, apparently. <laughs> Don't you have to have been great the first time to do again? I mean, we're still anyway. trying to figure out when America was great in the first place. Exactly. Obviously, it was June 15th, 1978 at 1028 a.m. Why? I what happened I, then? Because uh, I was born. That's, that's when America was great. They were like, here comes the kid who hates Reagan more than anybody. <laughs> Which, oh, I'm sure Nancy hated Reagan too. as well. Probably. Well, well God damn well, it. Never mind. I'm not going to say the joke. Important question, because um, we haven't totally touched it yet. Hey, Don, what's your favorite part of the movie? You want to see something? <laughs> Hands down. Hands down. That is my favorite scene. Because... That's so good. One, it, it's again, it's it's giving Django his agency, right? Giving him his agency, but it's also giving you, as an audience member, as an historian, as just just somebody watching the movie, you're like, fuck yeah, fuck those in the And and what people miss is they need to have that same, not by going up and bullwhipping anybody, but they need to have that same approach with the racist assholes in their family. Like if you can cheer a a racist enslaver being being getting his ass whipped, you can definitely cheer or root against the motherfuckers that want to bring shit like that back. 
and not like not not watch the news or watch TikTok and be like, oh man, that's so sad. We have Nazis. No, go fucking confront those assholes, please. Like you, ha- there are a lot more of you than of me. Go confront them because this Django is tired. <laughs> But to, to finish up the, the idea of my favorite scene, I love the tension. I love the way in which it's it's. God damn it. I love the crack of the whip on the guy. Just the, just the whole thing. I mean, just the way it's set up to you understand the anger and rage that somebody would have had. And, and many people did, whether we're talking about the German coast uh, revolts of the uprisings or, or Nat Turner or Denmark Vesey or anything like that. You think about the fact that you have so much of this angst and anger that has built up into you because of the injustice that you faced and God damn it. I'm going to get one in on it. I'm going to get one in. <laughs> like I'm going to beat the shit out of this guy. And, and what that would mean for any enslaved black person seeing that, but more so what would happen for any white person who sees that just the absurdity of, Oh my God, finally, this has happened. This is something I would love to see take place. Just love that. It's like when someone finally beat Roman. Um, Fuck you, man. (laughs) (laughs) You know what I find find most fascinating about this movie? I hate Cody Rhodes. If if you look at uh, Tarantino's heritage, on his mother's side, there's Cherokee and Irish. And I'm just amazed he didn't make a movie about Irish slaves. Well, Tarantino's not that stupid. Because Tarantino I couldn't resist. Knows. I had to get one terrible joke in here. So Yeah. Well, you know what? Let me address that shit. Yeah, please if, do. In tw- if in 2024, this is anybody who's listening, all five of you. This is 2024. If you are a stupid asshole who still brings up Irish slaves... You are a fucking moron and racist by that by that measure as well, because you're using indentured servitude to compare to chattel slavery. And not only that, there is no reputable university in it's like Ireland. Ireland doesn't exist for some reason for these idiots. Irish historians will fucking tell you that's not something. That was an internet hoax that got started in the early days of the internet, just like that spider thing. So if you bring up Irish slaves, you may as well bring up the whole fact that you you eat 87 spiders in your sleep every year. Both of them were internet hoaxes. I legitimately have a spider in my bedroom all the time, and I've never eaten him once. Because I have a pet tarantula, so you know. Uh, No, I I will say the one thing about Irish slave conversations, because, you know, I went to college with those asshole kids who say that shit. I've never seen it go well. I've never seen anyone else, just the person who brings it up. I've never seen a single second person go, yeah, you're right. What about that? Every single time it's been, what the fuck is wrong with you? And that makes me happy. My fa- my favorites are when people go all the way back to Rome and Greece. But, well, we technically we've all been slaves. I'm like, if you got to go to the fucking Bible or the classical period to come up with an argument to support slavery, you you're fucking gone. <laughs> and if you want to minimize slavery, to like, well, you know, it, all lives. Ma- you know, all lives, you know, everyone was slaves. And like, uh, okay, go fuck yourself. All yeah. slaves matter. All slaves matter. That's, that's what it Except sounds Steven. like to me. Except- <laughs> no, even Stephen matters. Even Stephen matters. That's oh, true. That's he, the emotional core does. when I get to his death. So, so my, favorite, my favorite part of the movie was actually the same scene, but later in the scene. Because I love comedic exchanges. Right? So mm-hmm. when, when he so right after y'all want to y'all want to see something, you know he he kills the two and just to make your point, you know there's a point that they emphasize where as he's whipping him, he steps on the gun. He could have yeah. just shot him and killed him. He kicks that gun out of the way. He ignores the gun and just goes like, no no no, I'm gonna beat you like you beat me. This is this has nothing to do with me killing you. It has nothing to do with the bounty. This this is personal. This mm-hmm. is for me. And then after that, you know, Schultz shows up and he's like, what's, what's going on? It's like him 
It's him. It's like Big John and Raj. It's like, where's Ellis? It's like he's over there high telling it out of the field. So the guy pulled his his, his uh, actually I wrote it down because I love that scene so much that I actually wrote down the dialogue. <laughs> because I mean, it's like where's Ellis? Like he's the one high telling it um, through the field right now. Like, are you sure that's him? Yeah. Positive? I don't know. You don't know if you're positive? I don't know what positive means. It means you're <laughs> sure. Yes. Yes what? Yes, I'm sure that's Ellis Brittle. Bang. Boom. Positive, he, positive did. he did. <laughs> <laughs> it's great. It's fantastic. It's just it's one yeah. of those really goofy, funny exchanges that in a Tar- in Tarantino, this is why I like Tarantino movies that I've seen. Um <laughs> like, yeah, he, he adds these little these little moments in. It's like you just watch the guy get beatly brute uh, uh, beat down by a whip. And then a flashback when when Django had gotten beat down with a whip, and you've seen all these, you know, all these. Then you got like a little bit of comedy in here, just like the uh, after this when they do the raid, they're preparing for the raid, and you had the bag conversation. That's my second favorite part of the movie because that whole scene is absolutely pointless. Yep, but it's, it's just like in Pulp Fiction. When they get to the apartment and they're in the hallway, John Travolta and Samuel L. Jackson, they're in the hallway. Like, hold on, it's a little bit early. Oh, let's just let's just walk over here, talk for a second. I'm like, there's no reason for the story to do that. It's mm-hmm. just, I mean, you could say he's filling runtime, which maybe he was, but at the same time, I feel like this is just a stylistic thing that Tarantino does, and he just throws in these little humanizing conversations, I guess it, it would be. It's like, these are just little off conversations that just people would have, because why not? You know, people getting mad at Jenny for not cutting the eye holes right, you know. I love that scene. <laughs> and then, of All course, Jonah Hill criticize, criticize, criticize. Criticize. And then, of course, there's that. Like, Tarantino... No one would say criticize, criticize, criticize. You'd say complain, <laughs> complain, complain. You'd say bitch and mode. But in Tarantino, he has this 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 weird thing about making that giving regular regular characters these highfalutin uh, vocabularies. Mm-hmm. Same thing uh, when the bride was fighting Benita Green in Kill Bill Volume One. You know. None of that language was necessary. But it was Tarantino. And it's what mm-hmm. he does. It's stylistically his. And I love those parts. Because they're funny. <laughs> it takes away from the brutality. It takes away from the realness of of the period. And uh, it just adds a little bit of levity. Impressive for a movie about slavery. You know what I would have liked to see? More of Walter Groggins. Well, I, I thought his character was great as it was, but I would have liked even more. Well, I, I got to correct you, James. It's Walton. Yep. As a as a fellow graduate of George Southern University, it is my job to protect people like Walton Goggins. Oh, cool. Not Jason Aldean. I don't give a shit about him. Um, Nobody should. Or whoever else went there. Because it's like, yeah, we're a small little community. There you go. <laughs> No, I, I love his character. I just show up in this movie. Well, he he does it so. It here's the thing about Walton Goggins, right? He does the shit so well. You start to question if that's how the fuck he feels. <laughs> and I and I don't mean that. And I don't mean that as a joke. I mean like yeah. you seriously are like t- with with Leonardo DiCaprio's character. You you get like it's the character. It's the character. He does so well in portraying him. But Walton Goggins, whether it's in this or in Hateful Eight or anything else that he's done, I mean, I don't need to pick just the Tarantino movies he's in. But anything that he's in, you're like, holy fuck, man. Like, are you actually this person? Plus, his teeth make his character so weird. (laughs) What they do? I can't help that. Uh, Oh, my God. So many digs at Mississippi. It's funny. All right. So, I, <laughs> oh, you know, here's here's the other thing that I just I, well, two things. 
it's this idea of what's known as Southern hospitality, right? The the idea that you're going to have Southern hospitality and genteel society, but you're doing just nefarious shit. Um, but the the other one being, oh shoot, I just lost it. My note. Oh, uh, oh my gosh, I completely lost it in my notes. All right. Um, oh, I'm sorry. The the obsession with with European shit. You know, you can't be enough of just being an American enslaver. You have to be a Francophile. You have to learn French or at least give the idea that you're learning French. And I got to tell you right now, James, you know, I've had this discussion. I can't remember if I had this discussion with you, Duan, but there's this weird thing in America where if you're speaking Spanish, that's wrong. That's horrible. You're dirty. There's something bad about you. But if you think you speak something else with the same fucking root language, either Italian or French, it's remarkable. You're okay. You're like, you're one of the good ones. You're one of the good immigrants. You're one of the good immigrant groups. And just this idea that Calvin Candy becomes a caricature of Southern culture, especially in the deep South of we respect things that are French. We respect things that are British. We love that stuff. We love it so much. I want to. I want to read more things in French. I want to hear the music. I want to. You know. I, I want to name my enslaved people after characters from a book that I didn't bother to fucking read. <laughs> Just. I mean, that shit still exists in the South. It's. It's. If you look at, uh, especially like uh, the Greek life culture, the sorority life. Holy fuck. It's it's the obsession, or at least the identity of, of much of the South, especially with the uh, more affluent South, is anything but American, right? It's it's all it's all good European shit is what we need to to bring up. You bring up where your family came from, uh, and then you'll name your kids certain. Or they go to school and they have to if they take a second language, they're only taking French. They're not taking Spanish. They're going to take French because we're going to go to Paris when when we turn 16 or 18 or whatever it happens to be. Um, these are people like a couple of people that were on my trip last week when we were coming back where, you know, they went to another country and complained about every fucking thing that they could. But then they will go home and post everything. They, or if they have already posted the Instagram, they, they post everything that's great about the trip, but complained about how. I don't know. It wasn't as European as they hoped it was going to be. Like it was in Europe. How much more European can you get? I swear to God, these are the conversations I overheard. It was like, well, I just thought Europe would be more impressive, impressive than this. Well, everybody just dressed so normal over here. I'm like, motherfucker, we're in Croatia. Calm the fuck down. <laughs> like we're not on the we're not in Paris for fashion week. And even if you're there in Paris for Fashion Week, guess what? The regular folks on the street are wearing regular fucking clothes. At least they know I know where France is. <laughs> Some of them wouldn't pass that one. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, the architecture, the style, the clothing, you know, all those things, it was just, you're, you're okay with the Europeans until they're like, no, you need to stop slavery. That's not the right thing to do. Or if you don't agree with slavery, you're soft-hearted, apparently. Yeah. It's, again, it's the kind of like I mentioned before. They, there was this, this, this need, this desire to imitate what we viewed as great before, you know. Mm -hmm. And that's where we, you know, Western civilization gets their definition of greatness from the the lives portrayed by you know royalty and you know the the English crown, the French crown for that matter. Mm -hmm. You know? And and again it, it's just reflecting in in how people when when they get a little bit of status, when they get themselves a little bit of clout, they behave not as themselves, but they behave as they're expected to behave. Mm -hmm. Because of that, like like you said before, if you and if you if I suddenly ended up rich, you never know. You'll catch me at Walmart twice a week. I hate yep. that store, but I'll be there. I taught my kids one thing: I'm like, hey, 
One thing y'all need to learn when y'all start having your own money, if anybody ever asks you how much money you got, say you're broke. Exactly. I don't care if you got a dollar in your pocket, a hundred dollars in your pocket, a million dollars in the bank, you're broke. Why would I, why would I lie? Because it ain't their business. You exactly. Not their business. You don't say nothing, you don't do nothing, but that's just to preserve yourself, right? These people, they're, they're not trying to preserve their, their selves. They're trying to project greatness by mm-hmm. imitating greatness, their perceived, their perceived greatness. Is all, you know when I said like the only real people you had in the movie was Schultz and Django. Um, I'll give Hildy a, a credit for that too, but it's because everybody else was essentially just trying to impress somebody else throughout the whole thing, and that's what that's what this whole period was, and it still is reflecting in you know people with money and you know rich folks today. Everyone's trying to spend all their time and energy impressing someone else. But Django, yeah, was, hey, Django was true to himself. He, he's like, I got me, and I got my girl, and that's what matters. Mm-hmm. I Imagine got away. what the world would be if people spent time being great instead. Right. It's like the definition of great shouldn't be, well, I'm going to be like this guy, or I, I'm going to do everything I can to you know, do like this guy did. I'm like, no, 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 no. My my definition of success, like to be great, you should be successful. And my definition of successful has nothing to do with money, has nothing to do with book sales or or merchandise sales or 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 podcast views or anything like that. None of those things factor into what I consider successful. Mm-hmm. Am I am I me? Am I doing what I want to do as me? If I am, I'm successful. Growing up, I had one dream, one dream, right? I wanted to write something, publish it, and hold a physical copy of it in my hand. Hmm. When my physical copies of of the Copperweek collection came in, I pulled my kids aside. I brought them into the hallway with me. I'm like, remember what I told you my dream was growing up? And I opened the pack and I pulled the book out. I held it with two hands. I'm like, I have just now completed my dream. Let this be proof that you can too. To me, to do that for myself and show that off to my kids, to prove that whatever dream they have, they can accomplish, that's success. You guys can't tell me nothing. I can be broke my whole life from here forward. Can't tell me nothing. I may never sell another copy of that book ever. Can't tell me nothing. I've not sold a hundred copies of that book. Can't tell me nothing, period. Because I held one in my hand. Because none of the other stuff matters. Because if you're if you're so focused on selling a hundred, now you need two hundred. If you're busy making a million, you go. You now you need two million. Now you got to beat that guy who's also a millionaire. Django is just like, no, you know what? I, I lost my wife. I'm going to get her back. I'm going to do what it takes to get her back. That's my goal. Nothing else ultimately matters. That was his sign of success. That was Django being great. It had nothing to do with the impressions of this person or that. All he wanted to do was have his happiness and have his wife. That was his level of greatness. And you know what's funny is that when we're talking about this this period after enslavement and, and, and post-emancipation, that was the majority of, of newly freed Black people. It's like, I just want my family. Like, I want my people. Yep. And as history would teach us, we did. Why, why can't, why couldn't the Blacks just do their own thing in their own town? Because we did. <laughs> and that shit got burned down. Places. They burn, them one, down them. burn that one down. <laughs> there, <laughs> Jesus. Like the the whole story of Forsyth, Georgia, is horrible. Like just because one one black person was accused of sexually assaulting a white woman, or there's a claim of it, right? Um, gets arrested. Then there's like a, a mini riot at the at the sheriff's department office, whatever, and the white folks show up because they want to lynch the person that's accused and then they just go ahead and tell everybody. I think they ended up lynching one guy, but then they go ahead and tell every other black person, get out of town. 
don't be here in the morning. So you got no no understanding of how much generational wealth has been destroyed just because someone else had the power to make someone else go away. Yeah. I mean, you know, when we talk about the reason, West, yeah, no other reason than race. No other reason than race. Yeah. We talk about people going West and how the government just said, hey, just take the land. Just take it. Uh -huh. That land is worth hundreds of thousands, if not millions today. And if a family owned that and stayed living on that, uh, that property, the, the, the money belongs to them. They put it in trusts, and that trust just goes down, and the beneficiaries change, and the wealth is, is still there. And, you know, Black people couldn't own property, you know, for the longest time. Been about in the state of Oregon. <laughs> it's like, imagine a state banned you because they're like, no, we can't have Black people here. Like, what the yeah. fuck is wrong with you? Okay. And that's crazy. Like, it's conceptually, it seems so ridiculous. But, I mean, generational wealth, that, that's one of the things. It's like, mm -hmm. we're in this spot now. There's, there's so many people who are just, they just have the money and they don't even think twice about it. While there's other people in the country who are just struggling day to day. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's just one of those, it's one of those things, man. And, and it, it all starts in this period and it's reflecting on how, you know, we talked about how the N-word was used all the time and how that was such a word of degra uh, degradation. That's how people viewed people of color. You know, mm -hmm. when you look at a person who, we were talking about French versus Spanish, you look at a person who typically speaks French, and then you look at a person who typically speaks Spanish, there are some obvious differences, and that's why those languages are, are perceived uh, the, the way they are why marijuana is called marijuana as opposed to just being called cannabis like it's supposed to be. I digress. <laughs> All right. Is there anything that we have not hit that you guys want to hit? Um, Calvin King. Well, the, the, <laughs> Jesus. Are we going to talk about how Leo cut his hand? Oh, yeah, I was going to say, especially if he cut his hand open on that piece of glass that was still on the table, or and just piece of a prop. Yeah, and, I have respect and, like, for I that. Think, well, well, not the the hand wiping part because I was like, once I knew, I was like, oh fuck! I thought this was, I thought it was a like prop blood the entire time. Like, god mm -hmm. damn you! It's like I, I get like really being into a scene, but holy shit, I'm not rubbing my blood on anybody. <laughs> unless unless he honestly thought like oh no i thought this you know i i hit something that made the blood come out i'm not like like a capsule or something on the table <laughs> oh no i think he was just fully in character and went for oh. it and <laughs> it looks glorious yeah. but holy shit yeah. that checks out um the only thing the oh go ahead no i'm just saying you don't want to waste a take so <laughs> no yep and it's a hell of a take I bet there were all kind. Of, I would need to see if there were like a lot of apologies to Kerry Washington when they when they cut. <laughs> Man, I mean that whole scene with the, I don't even know what you call it, but cutting the skull open and talking about the dimples and all that shit. Oh, the phrenology like, bullshit. Thank phrenology, you. Yeah. I, I hate that. That's all real. Like my fucking god, man, and like. I'm sorry, how many white people did you cut open to look at their skulls? <laughs> like, that was my question. Like, why is old Ben's skull still there? And how do you already know the dimples? Anyway, I mean, there are some plot holes where I'm like, I, I get it, but see, I... I don't no. even view them as plot holes. I just view them as Calvin's an asshole. So... But, uh... Oh, I did but have a question about Stephen. We kind of talked about how he's uh, disrespectful to Calvin, if you will. Uh, does part of that come from working for his dad, being a slave to his dad and his grandpa and that kind of shit? Like, is, is this Donald Jr. fuck you or, or is there any, any, uh, validity to that? Uh, it's, it's more an issue of the length of service. All right. You know, and, and also the idea of like, you know, Stephen was there before Calvin. 
Yeah. And because he's he's been there. So, and I, I guarantee you, Steven's been there a lot longer than any of, the, any of those overseers. Um, mm -hmm. And because the way that they respond to him is like he's in, you know, he, if he says something, uh, you know, it, it's coming from the big man. It's coming from Calvin Candy. It's not it's not Steven. So it's OK. It's Steven telling me what Calvin said. When the reality is Steven understands his role. He's like, no, if I tell these white folks to do something, they're going to think it's the big man saying it. So I can, I'll take credit. And if, if the big man corrects me, I'm like, I misunderstood. What, I'm an old man. I, I misunderstood what you were saying. I'm an old fool. Yeah. Oh, I'm so wrong. But, it, you know, I, but, like, I don't, I don't have a problem with Steven's character because I think it's portraying actual human behavior and the way in which somebody from a marginalized community would behave if they have a lot of resentment towards that community, but also understands that I'm in this spot, I'm doing mine, I'm gonna take care of me. I don't have anybody else. No, that I mean look like that the whole death thing is like you can't kill Candyland. We're we've been here for before you, we're gonna be here after. The whole idea that he associates himself with he's Candyland. Like he's he's so into it. Beautiful. With, I mean, whether it's brainwashing or if it's just conditioning, like he is that system. And oh. how dare you? And we accept well, the reality that we're presented with, and that's his reality. He doesn't leave. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, like we said earlier, like the movie really is Django versus Steven. Because in the end, they represent two different facets of the black experience at that period of time. You know, you could either be Stephen, who is so caught up in the system of, of, of slavery that he he is Candyland, you know, versus Django, who is just has got no ties to anyone, belongs to no one. He's kind of the envy of there, I, I'm, there's a potential where like either character could be envious of some facet of the other. Mm hmm. Steven could be envious of the freedom that Django has. Just something as simple as being able to ride in on a horse. Mm. Whereas Django can look at Steven and realize that Steven is essentially untouchable. In this space where Hildy was just in a hot box, Steven's not going to find himself in a hot box for real. No one's going to put Steven in a hot box. Baby's not going in the corner. You know, it, <laughs> he's he's going to be running things. He's going to have the ability to say something to Calvin, his own owner, but not get any repercussion. Mind you, while he's sitting there at the table, he's right over top of Calvin's shoulder, just beating everything. He's like, show me. That, that's right. <laughs> like, this isn't just Calvin saying it. This is Stephen and Calvin saying it. Oh, I'm sorry, sir. Calvin and Stephen. I'm so sorry. Yes, it's 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 them both saying it. it's coming from both of them. They're they are together in one in the view of Stephen. Because like you said, Stephen operates the house. He manages the house. Everyone in the kitchen responds to Stephen. All the hands out in the field, they respond to Stephen. Calvin's hardly even there. He's going back and forth between a couple of residences. You know, he's like, I've been gone for how many days and this is all all this is like I know, but I got this taken care of. This happened and this happened and this happened. And Calvin trusts him. And he knows that. So Cal, uh, Stephen exists in a period, in a point of this slavery, you know, rigmarole brouhaha, and he's untouchable. Whereas Django as a slave would never be able to do that. Um, I forgot the little girl's name who broke the eggs. She could never get away with that. Mm -hmm. Stephen could. And so Stephen is in the system, but outside the system, where Django is absolutely outside the system. Right. And those two positions are the conflict with each other, which is why Steven's the last one to go. You saved Steven for last. Because, you know, he had to take out the final boss. Mm -hmm. If you smell what I'm cooking. <laughs> oh, damn you. <laughs> I mean, I acknowledge that uh, Calvin was overall in charge, but I think you're absolutely right. So... <laughs> Um, this this analysis was too sweet, by the way. 
Even the way that uh, that Stephen demands Calvin go talk to him in the other room, like mm-hmm. that's a that's a level of understanding. You have power. He doesn't say, "Hey, b- hey, boss, could you come meet me over? You know, let's go over here." No, he's like, "Meet me in the library." Like, right. I mean, it's very. And Calvin, uh, like, mm, and Calvin trusts right him up. to know. Like right. that is power in the opposite direction as well. That's a uh, acknowledgement of power in the in the opposite direction, right there. Yeah, because you know he was safe for life, and there's no argument over you know his position at Candyland. He's not going to turn on you. I don't know if you guys know this. This is a weird tidbit that has nothing to do with anything. Uh, We're well, it does, but it doesn't. Uh, We're recording this on what June twenty eighth, and Jamie Foxx's daughter was recently married this week, and and her her big concern was that he desperately wanted to ride into the wedding on his horse, Django style, and I just I find that so fun (laughs) that that all these years later she's like, God damn it, don't don't do the Django thing. It's like, oh, yeah. the, it's like doc, calling Dr. Sunshine. He's just <laughs> hanging on to that old roll. It's beautiful. <laughs> oh, right. my gosh. You guys got anything else before we move to Movie Rex? Uh, I don't really have anything else. Uh, no, nah, I really got a Movie Rex. Oh, did either one of you see the after credit scene? There's an after credit scene? Yes, there yeah. is. I, I, I saw him and his wife right, right away, and that was it. I just didn't bother to turn off the movie, and it just it's the it's the, the three slaves uh, that were in the cart as the, when Django uh, took out the LeQuint Dicky uh, Mining Company. Mm-hmm. They're just like, who is that guy? <laughs> <laughs> Lord. Well, here's a here's an interesting universe thing. It is believed that uh, Jamie Foxx's character Django and Broomhilda and and, mm-hmm. and Carrie, Hill, uh, Carrie Washington's character, uh, they are the ancestors of Shaft. When Tarantino has like basically said so, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I thought so. I thought he, he acknowledged that, he's that like, and said yes because he threw in a couple of nuggets, like even that you know the whole who's that. Um, and then it kind of fits into the song of Shaft. Well, well I'll be. <laughs> All right. I suppose Which that brings us to when Shaft goes to Africa. So, oh man. All right. I suppose that brings us to movie Rex. Stwan, you are the guest. You get to go first. Um, when I see a, a Tarantino movie, I see a Tarantino movie. So there are all these little bits that like I pointed out before that like are kind of a, all the Tarantino movies. So I would my recommendation would literally be any Quentin Tarantino movie. Uh, my favorite being Kill Bill Volume One. I know it doesn't seem to to have the the same premise, but you have your your heroine who is wronged at some point and she overcomes all the things that wronged her and sought revenge against um, the people who were responsible for it and then came out on top of the end. So. Nice. Cool. So I normally do a double feature and I thought long and hard about this. I thought in different directions, like what's my favorite Western ever, which is the quick and the dead. And I was like, that doesn't really roll with this. Like, you know, other than Leo being in it, that's about it. And of course, there's a a nice cameo by Tobin Bell at the beginning who gets killed. So I'm always happy when I see Jigsaw. But I didn't didn't really feel like a good double feature here. So then I was like, what's like a really deep, like a critique of reality, that kind of thing. I just kept going different directions. And I literally did not come up with a double feature I was happy with. And that's when I landed on, I think you should fucking watch this again. And I'm going to rely on Dwan because you've watched it three times in three weeks. And how has that experience changed your viewing with it? Like, are you still finding totally different stuff? Are you looking at it differently? Like, what happens when you rewatch this right away? Mm-hmm. Um, so when I first watched it, it was, it was tough. Um, 
as you can imagine, any depiction of slavery that that deep, that violent, uh, to a black man is gonna gonna strike some chords. Mm-hmm. But as you get past that, and you, I started looking and focusing towards like the stylistic things of it. Um, you just start to see a hero story. Like I was comparing it just a moment ago to Kill Bill, Kill Bill Volume One, uh, which is nothing uh, story-wise in comparison. But you start to see the the elements of it, of like the 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 person overcoming the adversity and how they utilize some rando skill they have. Django's an excellent marksman. Uh, the bride was a swordswoman. Um, so yeah, you just start breaking it down, and I guess you look at it more deeply um, from the elements because the story, you know, the story. You know, after you've watched it two or three times, you get the story. So after that, you just start breaking it down to look at how it functions stylistically. At least I do. Nice, Don. I've made history here tonight. I have finally managed to not steal one of your answers. So with all of your movies intact, except the Tarantino ones, what are your 852 movie recommendations? All right. Uh, So anyway, I'm going to give 1865 uh, in order to. Nice. I had made that joke. That was a good one. (laughs) Well done. Could have said 13, but anyway. That's uh, 18. Um, That's around the same time that my state Arizona is obsessed with. Jesus Christ. I'm getting started. At least you're in the the late 19th century, Mississippi. Jesus fucking Christ. Anyway, um, I, I did forget one thing on my notes, and this is just like another fan theory. And it's it's one of those things that if you go back and watch the movie with this perspective, you can see it a little bit differently. If you notice when Stephen, you know, confronts Django, like Django's up on the balcony or the on the landing, looking over him, he's like, "Oh, you know, I count six bullets." He's like, "I count two guns." And at that moment, Steve is like, I'm going to have to fight this motherfucker, right? Because he, he he throws down his cane when he thinks that he doesn't have a second gun. And the theory is, because what Calvin Candy does, that Stephen ended up getting that position, and then, of course, earned more respect on the way, got that position because he was a winning Mandingo fighter. Ooh. Go back and watch him talk to a thing with Samson. Like Samson, Sheba, and and Stephen are the only black people he talks to with some level of respect. So it makes sense that maybe he was a Mandingo fighter, maybe he wasn't. Maybe this is a moment where he's like, "I'm not going to beg for my life. I'm going to stand here and, and fight you, or I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to dispatch of you, however I will." But there there's not a moment where he's he's sorry or he apologizes. There's not this moment in which you get to see Stephen as being anything other than He's fucking Steven. Even when he's been shot, like he's still sitting there like, no, we're going to fucking, you're going to be in the wanted pictures now. You're going to be, are you going to be on the wanted posts? We're going to get you for this. Gonna, he's still defiant. Like, no, like I'm not giving up. The man has to be blown up. <laughs> that's, that's his ending, which is great. I mean, it, and I think Samuel Jackson even said that's one of his favorite character deaths. That and uh, Snakes on a Plane. I'm sorry, not Snakes on a Plane. Um, like Deep Blue Sea. Oh, okay. But uh, the story of him doing Snakes on the Plane is hilarious because it was a friend of his who wrote it or was planning on making the movie. So this is what it's called. It's like, what's it about? Snakes on a Plane. All right, I want to do it. And that was that was the conversation about getting him into the movie. Sweet. All right, so my movies, in no particular order, Blazing Saddles, um, for our good friend and friend of the show, Brett Terhune, Army of Frankensteins. Nice. Black Klansmen, and now more more serious ones: Selma, Malcolm X, uh, Inglorious Bastards, Jackie Brown, Unchained Memories, which was an HBO product. Uh, oh my gosh, probably twenty five years ago, where they had famous black actors read the the slave narratives, and of course Samuel Jackson was one of the people that was included in that. Does a great performance uh, of of reading those narratives. Uh, Hateful Eight, Magnificent Seven, True Grit, Hell or High Water, which is a very underrated uh, Western. It's portrayed as though it's a bank robbery movie, but it's really more of a Western genre. 
uh, Departed, Don't Look Up, one of James's favorite movies, Pig, uh, mm-hmm. Manchurian Candidate, Free State of Jones, Gangs of New York, Mystic River. I think I already said Jackie Brown. Yeah, I did. Jackie Brown, I wrote down twice because it's such a wonderful movie. I watch it every Christmas. Same thing with Django. Uh, Antebellum with Janelle Monet, the original Django, The Color Purple. I wrote Jackie Brown three times. Holy shit. <laughs> I'm just so mad that I didn't think of Antebellum. That would have definitely been my double feature. Oh, man. And if you haven't heard that episode, go listen to it because. Rhonda is an amazing guest in the conversation. And that was fantastic. All right, go she ahead. Is. Sorry. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Before, before I was interrupted. <laughs> That's then my, right. Then my last film, uh, obviously, I'm going to include this movie. Uh, actually, I didn't include this one. So Free State of Jones with Matthew McConaughey. And then my last film, obviously, because anybody who knows me knows that I'm going to mention this movie anytime a Tarantino movie is brought up. Um, let's go ahead and throw in Desperado in here as well as Pulp Fiction. Nice. All right, I have one more, and I'm throwing this in because, number one, I throw it in randomly. Number two, I love this movie. And number three, our guest is The Moon. So I have to talk about Moon, one of my favorite movies. Everyone should watch (laughs) Moon, but I can't tell you why. All right, let's bring it back to The Moon. Where can people check out your podcast? Where can they get your books? Where can they see you at a convention very soon? And uh, anything else you want to throw in there? Oh, um, where can they sign up for your newsletter? All right, go ahead. Well, all of those things that you mentioned can be, uh, you can start the uh, journey at dwanlhern.com. Uh, the link to my shows, Sako in the Moon, which is live on Fridays at 2 p.m. on YouTube. And, um, the Moon Eagles Wrestling Podcast that is usually released on Thursdays on my YouTube channel. Uh, you can get the book, The Copy Week Collection, uh, on Amazon. Uh, you can sign up for the newsletter that comes out every month where I just talk about the random things that are happening around me because there's a lot of projects about to really pop off probably here after Imaginarium, the convention that I'll be attending as a panelist for the first time um, this July. Wait, and get the fuck I'm up here. for another award. I um, thought you've been a panelist before. Nope. That's awesome. I've just been an attendee. So I'm, this, uh, I'm a panelist this year, and I'm up for yet another award. Going for long form, um, best screenplay. Got, I got some big shoes to fill if I manage to... to uh, to win that award for the cool kids. I, I heard the last two years they just gave it to some dude. They were like, yeah, whatever, take this. <laughs> well, he's one of the cool kids, so I give him credit. And I uh, happen to be up for short, so we could just trade from last year. We can. Uh, I'm cool with that. But I hope you get the first place trophy this time instead of the runner-up. I do not care, but it's it's yeah, fun to everything. be nominated. It is. It's, it's nice. It's, it's good to be recognize for your art and your craft. It's also um, yeah. fun to have two and run around and pretend to be Owen Hart for the night. I'll just throw that out. <laughs> well, enough is enough, and it's time for a change. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, everything about me, you can start the journey at dwanelhern.com. What I've learned in all this is that it's really, really cool to say, you know what, just Google me. <laughs> And it actually is me. Like it's like if you Google Dewan L. Hearn, it's all my stuff. And that's pretty damn dope. I, I try to tell people not to Google me, but you know, it's it doesn't work. Well, when you Google yourself, you get in trouble. Oh man, we should have uh, oh, if you Google me, you will get a Western the Sabata trilogy and audio Sabata always comes up first. We should have done that for the final episode. That would have been great. <laughs> but uh yeah cool i guess that wraps it up for another week Duan, thank you for being here as always yes, i came really close to making my double feature nope just because you've done it before and because i love that fucking movie but you know i don't know there's a lot it's of things a, people can go up with this it's a it's an absolute honor before we go to have been able to not only do this show once twice but four times, and I'm on. I'm I'm with you guys on the way out. Uh, 
quick story before you close it out. One of the things I was told after my very first uh, convention was when you meet, you know, when you come to this convention, these are the people you want to meet if you want to take your craft seriously. And I met you two at that first Imaginarium that I attended. And I was talking to a buddy of mine and he's like, when you come across opportunities, say yes. Just say yes to them. <laughs> and you guys reached out to me about doing high tension, the high tension episode. Um, and I, w- I wasn't sure at first. I almost said no because I was apprehensive. I was just nervous. And I was like, you know what? Fuck it. What's the worst that can happen? I do the show. They hate me. I never do the show again. Um, but like I said, this is episode four now that I've done with you guys. And it's an absolute honor. Uh, you guys had a great product here. And it's a damn shame to see it go. But you guys are going to go on a high note. And it's a blessing while I was here. Thank you. Well, I will say that out of, yes, first, thank you. I will say that out of 250 episodes plus all the Simpsons episodes, I mean, there's only like 15 episodes where we hated people and never brought them back. So, no, <laughs> I'm kidding. It's not that high. <laughs> uh, but uh, no, I, I clearly remember meeting you and I loved your enthusiasm. Like, we do a lot of cons and we do, we meet a lot of people. And it's rare to meet somebody who's legitimately so excited about writing, still believes in all of the magic, and and you just exuded that. And I hope that never fully goes away. Some of us have become very jaded. I won't mention my name. But uh, it, it's nice to, to see it and remember why I ever wanted to do this stuff. Well, just know that if, if the Necronoma.com... Uh, is, is going to end. I have a million and one shows that I'm doing. You guys are always welcome uh, on any of the shows that I'm hosting. Uh, I know you're taking a break, James, but Don, if you want to ever appear on either Socko in the Moon or Moon Equals Wrestling, just, you just hit me up and it's done. Oh, well, it's going to happen. Socko Sacco, Sacco reached out to me after one of James's posts. I'm like, not yet. Not right now. Not right now. <laughs> <laughs> I should have asked you first. I'm sorry. <laughs> anyway. But yeah, cool. Well, I suppose that wraps it up for another week then. As always, I am James Sabata. I'm D'Artagnan, motherfucker. And we will see you next week here at the Necronomic.com. <laughs> <laughs>